This week's episode is sponsored by White's Beaconsfield. White's Beaconsfield is the number one company in the UK to brighten up your smile at a very affordable price. Get your perfect smile today using code AGJAMESENGLISH at checkout for a 15% discount on all products. from White's Beckinsfield. I'm on day five out of seven and my teeth are looking white. So it doesn't contain peroxide, so it's very, very safe for you to use on your teeth. It doesn't cause any sensitivity and I've literally got the most sensitive teeth. The most affordable product, works like a dream. Look how white, with no filter, no sensitivity, and it is just one of the best that I've ever used. Right, that's three days, it's crazy. That was the period of life that woke me up. I was, you know, interviewing people, you know, like Biggie Smalls and Mob Deep and Snoop Dogg, and they were talking to me about, you know, the music Illuminati and all this stuff. And I was like, what? Dr. Dre and I clashed badly. Genius as well. Yeah, but we clashed badly. Why? Two strong characters, but Dre was also quite handy with his fists around women. One thing can be a bit off, right? We're not talking about one thing. We're talking 20, 30 things, you know, that all kind of keep adding up and keep stacking yeah. up that make you have to go, this story is not as told. Was she covering up paedophile rings and everything? Deeply, though. Yeah. So deeply, though. The connection between him and Epstein, how strong was that? I think it was strong. Yeah. I think it was it was a lot stronger than he would want us to believe. Oh, no, some people want the age of consent to be four. What? <laughs> Fucking hell, man. What country is this? UK, no our, way. our nation, yes. Ghislaine Maxwell's sister Isabel and how she was involved in event 201, the round table event to do with the um, Gates Foundation, which was saying a coronavirus pandemic was coming that they mm. did last October. And the Maxwells are involved in that sort of stuff. Do you know what I mean? They're, they have their fingers in lots of pies. They've lied to us so consistently, mm -hmm. right? Whatever it's about, whether it's about coronavirus or vaccine they lie to us constantly mm -hmm. they don't give us factual information and so we are forced to question narratives constantly and find out invariably that many many narratives don't stack up Boom, we're on. Yeah, go on, let's do it. Yes, we're on. And today's <laughs> guest, we've got Sonia Poulton. How are you? I'm well, thank you, James. Love your stuff. Thank you. Very out there. Ditto. Very well researched. Thank you. Doing well. Always in Sean Atwood's stuff. Talking about some serious, serious stuff. Your yeah. stuff is always spot on. Thank you. Um, your documentary, Pedophiles of Parliament. Yeah. Very powerful. Thank you. Again, to be doing that kind of stuff, because I know you're everywhere on mainstream TV as well. I know you've done a lot of hundreds of debates on TV. Yeah. So first of all, fair play. Thank you. How's life? Well, it's a juggle, isn't it? I mean, they don't call me juggler for nothing, really, <laughs> which has always been my nickname. Um, but you know, life is good. I can't complain. I mean, I have my health now. I have my health back after being sick most of this year, surgery, what was then deemed as COVID, although I don't know about that, but certainly had some sort of infection. But no, I'm really, really grateful. And I and I think that I'm even more grateful in contrast to what so many other people are going through. Yeah, because I've been there. It's, you know, and I think once you've seen the darkness, you really do appreciate the light, right? Yeah. So, and that's where I feel I'm at mm -hmm. at this moment in time. Life feels just much more clear. It's much more lucid. There's more clarity to it. And 
you know, and with that appreciation. Yeah, really. clarity is a beautiful thing when you've got that. Yeah. Life seems easier. Yeah. We've got so much to touch on. We have. But I always go back to the start of my guests. Go on. Because I, I watch a lot of your stuff and it's all about other people. Yeah. But we'll touch on you today and okay. get a bit of background, kind of where you grew up and how it all began. Okay. Well, I was born in Gloucestershire in in the 1960s. Um, the youngest child of... Uh, now, this is where it gets more complicated because I come from a complicated family. So my mum was potentially married three times. I say potentially because we don't know for certain if she was married to all of the three men that we thought were her husbands. And my father was potentially married three times as well. And they each had a family with those. And I was the last of both my mother and my father. Um, and um, my father left the house when I was three. Um, he bought me some, it was my first memory. He bought me some building blocks. It had letters on one side, numbers on another. And he said that he wouldn't be seeing me again. Um, and that would be the last time. And that was really the only promise that he kept. <laughs> and I never saw him again. And um, then when my daughter was born in 1997, well, actually he then um, traced me or rather I traced him actually when I was in my twenties. And it was really odd because I, my brother had said, look, I think he might be in this area. Um, have a look and uh, and I remember ringing director inquiries and I said an area and they gave me three numbers and the first number I rang I rang the number a man picked up the phone and I said hello it's Donald Trainer there and he said hello Sonia I've been waiting for this moment and that was just weird that was like literally you know from three years old to like being 24 and that was the first time I talked to him we talked on and off for a year we clashed terribly I didn't want to see him I was still very very emotionally messed up um, and resentful and angry because my mum had died at 11. So I felt like I'd really kind of, be, you know, been left. I didn't see him again. And I regretted it because when my daughter was born in 1997, I, I desperately then wanted grandparents for my daughter. And she has a grandmother on her father's side, but that's her only grandparent. And I thought, well, she does have a grandfather. So let me find him. And... I finally managed to track him down. I think it was about the middle of October and I'd missed him by 15 days. He died on October the 1st. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, so that was a bit like I was ready for him now mm. and I wasn't ready for him before and there was a lot of, you know, issues attached to that. But we grow and we learn mm. and we forgive and I realised that my mum and my dad were dealing with all manner of shit like I've been dealing with it throughout my life like we all have and I forgave him. And um, and I talk to him now, you know, yeah. I talk to him now. Are you spiritual yourself? Very. And I come from that background. I grew up around a seance table. My mum was a medium. Um, it was, I, I was 18 when I first realised that not everybody believes in spirits. That was a shock to me. I've moved to London. And it's, I suppose it's like children who were raised in abusive households. They think that's what every household experience is. Well, I thought everybody, every household experience talking to spirits. That's what I thought until I was 18 and discovered actually, no, that's not what all my new London friends did. So that was how I grew up. I grew up around a seance table. I thought it was perfectly natural. The year before mum died, her husband, my... Um, Stepdad? My stepdad, who had died before mum had met my dad. He died of cancer. And th those are my main brothers and sisters, my two brothers and my sister who raised me when mum died. We have a different father, but you'd never know it. We're as close as anything. Love them to bits. Always been there for me and vice versa. Um, but mum was extremely spiritual. I am naturally so. I, I mean, I... I hear, I see, I smell, I do all manners. I, you know, do different things to try and get in touch with that other world out there, whether that's tarot or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, really. I meditate a lot. Um, I always make sure I come back to the core of me. That's really important. But my work is absolutely guided by this something else that's around me, definitely. Yeah. Do you yeah. feel protected then? 100%. Because the stuff you speak out about is... Yeah some of the strongest and yeah. most powerful families not just in the UK but yeah. worldwide so yeah. you've kind of got to have the confidence yeah. that you are protected or else it's, the men in black suits will come yeah <laughs> yeah well I I literally work on the basis that I I mean I I know I know it sounds mad and and people say this as just something to say but I genuinely mean it and that is I would rather die die in a hail of bullets than on my knees I, I I'm not a compliant character and so that to me is death already, right? If you can't 
express yourself. I, you see, for the stuff that I've seen, I can't now unsee it. And so to act as if these injustices, these things aren't happening, that's not living to me. That's not how I've been raised. I've been raised to see it, say it, yeah. <laughs> you know? And also what my mum taught me, and which is a really valuable lesson, and that is the most important things we see uh, well the most important things are not what we see in here but what we don't mm -hmm. so it's the subtext of what people don't say to us you know people are, will happily tell you a million things but oftentimes the things that they're holding back or that are in between the lines those are the important things and the same thing with the sort of the spiritual spirituality around us i'm sure this room is absolutely full right now we just can't see it right mm -hmm. and that's how i operate my life and i feel completely protected on a constant basis i always feel like somebody's with me yeah but that's a good thing to feel yeah that there's some there no matter yeah. if you're alone you feel as if someone's there so yeah. from the ages 11 when your mum passed yeah how was your life like then very very difficult um i lived with my sister and her husband my sister was only 18 and she was pregnant she'd been in a care home very difficult background with we a lot of poverty we were an unusual family anyway, small village in Gloucestershire, which was which was in many respects quite middle class and we weren't. We were the family where which was a, it was like an open youth club mum operated. So I had two older brothers who were late teens. My sister was um, in her teens and there was seven year difference between me and my sister, 11 years between me and my brother and 13 years between me and my other brother. So our home was a youth club. It was the place where all the boys and girls came and, you know, teenagers who played cards and they smoked and they drank. It was that home, right? It was lovely. It was brilliant and everybody loved it. But it was the house that the police always arrived at in our small little village and, you know, that everybody talked about and everything. So that was, it was that was my background. So then my sister was pregnant at 18 when mum died and which hard already. Right. So but she became my guardian. So I was 11. She was 18. That's tough to become a mm -hmm. guardian of 11 year old. Did you just fight a lot? We did. But I adore my sister and she adores me. And we are like this. Mm -hmm. Don't anybody mess with my sister because no. I'll take you down. And mm -hmm. that applies to all my family. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and vice versa. But from 11, that was very, very difficult. And I just... A lot of it's a blur to me. I, I attempted suicide twice by the time I was 13 um, with pills. Um, I was found, but I, I didn't want to die, but I wanted everybody to know how fucking miserable I was and how hurt I was and how I didn't understand the world. And, uh, and so I don't... I think there's a big difference between the way that men attempt suicide and the way oftentimes that females attempt suicide. And that's not to say that all females who take tablets only, it's only a cry for help. Some do want to kill themselves, but I studied psychology and the difference between how, when men attempt suicide, they're not messing, right? They're, they're gonna hang themselves or they're putting a bullet through their head or stuff like that. And I wasn't up for that. I just wanted people to find me. I just wanted people to find me. So it was very difficult. Can I out for help? Massively so. Massively mm -hmm. so. I was failing in school. They said that I was, well, backwards. They thought that my English was backwards, regressive, as they described it. They wouldn't let me do literature. But there was a subtext of this, actually, she's she's an orphan. Is anybody, and nobody was considering any of this, all this stuff, you know, that my life was a bit chaotic and hectic. My brothers were... Because the thing is, my brothers and my sister, they also lost their mum, right? So we were all floundering. It was really, mm -hmm. really hard period. Um, but I started to come together about 15. I moved with in with my brother, my eldest brother and his wife. They started to really straighten me out a lot. I knew I was going to move to London anyway. And at 18, I said, I want to move to London. They said, I couldn't move to London unless I went for a week found a place to live and found a home. Even though 18, I was perfectly legal to, but mm -hmm. they were protecting me. And I came, I found a job and a place to live in three days, follow a week, I moved up to London, didn't know anybody and that was it. That's how you that that's, kind of all began. That's how, I, that's how I rolled. So how did you get into journalism? Um, well, by accident, as you do with these things. Um, I One of the reasons I wanted to come to London was I loved acting and I really wanted to act, but actually, the more I started to mix with people who were more professional, the more I realised I wasn't very good at it. But what I was good at was telling the truth and, and telling it very loudly. And so it was sort of a strange natural progression, really. I was, you know, into clubs. I worked on the 
door at the Empire in Leicester Square for a few years. I was clubbing. Then I saw an advert in the local newspaper. I think it was the Kensington and Chelsea Post or Hammersmith and Fulham, but it was one of those local newspapers. And they wanted an editorial assistant. Well, I had no experience whatsoever, but I knew I liked to write. But that wasn't what they wanted. They wanted an editorial assistant. Now, so, but these two brilliant, brilliant men uh, who became my mentors, really, and that was Kim and um, the editor called Ray Fox come in. They were absolutely brilliant. They took me in. They took me under their wing. Within six months, I was running the arts page. I'd started off opening the mail, making coffee, but Ray was like, she's a bright spark. And so, but there was the, there was a National Union of Journalists chapter at, our newspaper because it was 17 local newspapers in central and west london and they were furious that i was being given a job as writing which i understand why because they had to protect their members everybody else had been through the nuj i hadn't i'd bunked out of college i didn't really have a lot of you know of anything really other than my character um and so i started running the entertainment pages because i loved music all my you know i come from musical background i love music um and uh Stayed there for about three years. Then I got headhunted to go to work for this new organisation called Myro, Music Industry Research Organisation, which was a sort of subscription Bible that the music industry had every month. And we created it. And I was, so I was headhunted to help set it up. I think I stayed there for about a year, made great success of it. And then I went to work for Echoes, which which was a Black Music Weekly, because that was my love. Black music was very much my love. And I became their hip hop editor. And um, that was that was it, really. Mm-hmm. That was and from that. And then when my daughter arrived in 1997, I stopped being a music journalist. I'd been a music journalist for 10 to 12 years. And uh, but I carried on the same theme. My writing has always been about the underdog, about injustices a lot of, obviously a lot of hip-hop was about you know racism about injustices in society that really interested me that was what woke me up that was the period of life that woke me up I was you know interviewing people you know like Biggie Smalls and Mob Deep and Snoop Dogg and they were talking to me about you know the music Illuminati and all this stuff and I was like hmm. what the hell is all this did you know about? nothing about all that stuff I was quite time? no I was it was some. I I had an idea of it because a friend of mine, Darren, always used to tell me about it. And that was the days before the internet. Now you just go on the internet, but then people would have to rock up at your door and they'd share mm-hmm. something with you, a piece of information. Do you know what I mean? And it's like that looks really odd. Why does why is that person doing that symbol or sign or everything? That's how it used to mm-hmm. be. Six six six. Yeah. Who was in Biggie Smalls? Oh, lovely. Christopher was absolutely lovely. Mm-hmm. I travelled with him. He was absolutely adorable. Um, he was a gentle giant. I mean, really a gentle giant. He told me that on the last occasion that I met him, we travelled in Holland. Um, and he said that I wouldn't see him again. He said, it's the last time you're going to see me. And six months later, he was dead. It was so weird. And that interview, which was reproduced by The Guardian, in which he talked about how he'd come up from the ghetto and he thought his life was going to be really good, but he didn't realise that all this envy and hate would follow him. People who wanted to bring him back down again. You know, crabs in a bucket, you mm-hmm. know how they work. Yeah. Crab tried to get to the top of it and then the like other crabs pull him back yeah. down again. That was basically mm-hmm. his existence. Really cool, really cool dude though. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? That even Tupac, when he sings his songs, he knew he used to sing that he was going to die young as well. They know. They knew. As if you get a feeling that my time's up. Well, I think to a certain degree, um, but also the lifestyle that... It, and it's... It, it, it's not even so much their lifestyle, it's the people around them, you know, the, the sort of violence that was around them that permeated their world. Do you think the papers blew it all out of proportion on the news? When it was just a fight between or an argument between Biggie Smalls and Tupac, do you think the papers expanded that even oh, more? Oh, 100%. To hate what and the more? East Coast, West yeah. Coast, that was. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't just the papers, right? Suge Knight was pushing that because he realised there was money to be made mm-hmm. in that. Actually, Puffy less so, um, who was obviously on the East Coast with Bad Boy Records and everything. And it's quite interesting. Puffy is a, an example of somebody who always has that sort of, he had that sort of elusive quality about him. But when I, and I've interviewed him a few times as well, P. Diddy now, he used mm-hmm. to be Puffy then. Changes his name. Yeah, up exactly. Week. Sean, Sean mm-hmm. Combs. On one of the first occasions I went to interview him, it was weird. I turned up at his office at Bad Boy Records and he wasn't there, but he'd given permission to his assistant for me to go into his office, snoop around, look through his desk. And if I was like, what? This is really weird. Because he wanted me, he'd studied my work, which Mm -hmm. is why he'd allowed me to come. He wanted me to get this richness of him. 
And it was just that it blew me away, absolutely blew me away. And after he'd let me snoop around his office without him, they probably had me filmed, of course. Mm. They then drove me down to his apartment. And I remember walking in and his hand was all bandaged because he, and he claimed that he'd, he'd broken it on a glass. But that wasn't the rumour at all, you know. And I think at that time he was going through very, very difficult times. And I don't know what his mental state was like, mm. put it that way. So yeah. it was just I think it was suicidal. I think it was possible that he wasn't quite the rock mm. that he was it was hard on him he wasn't coming from the same background as Suge Knight yeah. and he was pitted against Suge Knight and what was mm. going on he's on a the West proper Coast. dangerous man Suge Knight yeah, he's very, done a yeah, lot yeah. of murders because when you hear Dr Dre that talking when he used to go up to the office Suge Knight had people tied up in covers and he's done a few murders and because he took but they says that it was him set up the two-pack murder as well but then he says it was shot in the head as well again it's all bullshit as it's well it's very but difficult it's such a a weird one especially young cu kids coming from a bad neighborhood well and, and when you come from like crenshaw state, yeah. south central la mm -hmm. and it's really weird because easy e from nwa who i came to know very very well and obviously you died. it was easy -E? lovely adorable little nutcase huh was that nutcase not what was that nutcase oh yeah he, yeah he well Actually, he was... They say Suge Knight injected him with AIDS well, because the AIDS was so full-blown. He never went through any stages. Well, he, he just warned had... me about Suge. Yeah. He warned me about Suge because when he was going through a court case, right, the, basically when they when they released Ethel Ross Zagin, which obviously was a reverse of, of N-word for life. I can't say the N-word. I just can't. I, can't, I don't mm. have it in me. Um they wanted to get that band in the UK. And so NWA asked me to be their witness about the cultural relevance of that album and what it actually meant. And it's, it's quite tricky when you're when you as a you're sort of a white woman coming from Gloucestershire and you, you've got this album <laughs> about, you know, you know, mm -hmm. bitches and hoes and everything. <laughs> and, but but there, is, there, is, there is a context mm -hmm. to it. And I went to South Central LA. I went to Ice Cube's home. I met his family you know and his mum saying to me i don't know why my o'shea swears so much mm. and he's a genius a lyrical genius brilliant so as age cube fan fantastic brilliant man. brilliant so so you can see that i've had quite a mm -hmm. uh, you know I've, I've, I've i've considered myself extremely blessed how many people can say you know that they yeah. say nice ice cube's home do you mm -hmm. know what i'm saying and, yeah. and got to know got to know his mum a little bit and dr dre and i clashed badly genius as well yeah but we clashed badly why two strong characters but Dre was also quite handy with his fists around women. Was he? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he had attacked one woman called Dee Barnes, beat her up, TV presenter in America. Um, he's beat up several Why? Times because he's a, a violent misogynist. But that, that, he came across as the cool one, kind of the yeah. brains. and. If it were not for Easy E, Dre would have thumped me on one particular You're day. You're joking? Yeah, Why? I, we, were, Why? we were at a hotel in... Oh, where was it I think it was Paddington I was interviewing them they'd come to play in Brixton I'd met them before they'd come to play in Brixton but Dre was just weird and I was just asking questions and he just took umbrage to one and he went to leap towards me and easy threw himself in between us what? both it was just really weird really really weird that was a very were long time ago weed at the time? no actually Dre was much less so on mm -hmm. any of that I mean I know they did the whole chronic thing and everything but Dre was much less so on that mm -hmm. than then it, it appeared. He was a businessman. Dre was always a businessman, which, and he still is, you of know. Of course, he's just done Dre beats, didn't he? Absolutely. And I can separate out as much as possible the thug from the genius. Dre was never a thug, though. He came from a, a, a posh art Do area. you remember when he was in all of his frills and everything? Because yeah. he came from mm -hmm. that background as yeah. well, you know, and often. Ice Cube was not a thug, mm -hmm. not a thug. You know, as I say, his he was a businessman. He was the first one to leave NWA. Yes, he was because he was getting shafted off. Yeah. Heller, what was his name? Yeah, Jerry uh, Heller. Jerry Heller. Jerry Heller. Um, yeah, it was. I mean, it was. It was. That's unbelievable, man. To be involved in that period yeah. as it was happening mm -hmm. was an amazing Change experience. It, it was the thing is, is I don't. I'm not a great fan of hip hop mm -hmm. in these days because it's just rubbish. I mean, you know. Nicki Minaj, Drake, these people are just, they, they just don't work for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. But I was very, I loved NWA. I loved Public Enemy, Jungle Brothers, Tribe Called Quest, British bands, Demon Boys. I've managed hip hop bands. I managed Demon Boys, PLC, DJ Pogo. I loved it. I absolutely loved what about, it. about um, Vanilla Ice? Um, well, obviously he was completely panned. Because Suge Knight held him over 
yeah. a veranda and yeah. try to kill him or threaten him to sign the rights away from Ice Ice Baby. Yeah. And Suge Knight still got the rights to that this day. Yeah. I mean, Suge was not one to mess with. And and it was easy, as I say, who first warned me, I'd not heard of Suge. And so this court case that they'd asked me to take part in, and mm. on the night after it, Easy had called me from LA. He's like, thank you so much. I was so grateful. And I was like, listen, I've just been honest. I've said, I don't know. I always agree with what you say. And some of it is incredibly disparaging towards women. But I do understand the context of, of where you're coming from. And he said, I want to just tell you about one person you've just got to watch out for. And I said, who's that? And he said, his name's Shug Knight. And I'd never heard his name before. Um, and, and I was like, what? And he's like, he's poisonous. He's got in with Dre. They, they're threatening me. And he's, they just went off on this whole long list of stuff about how Shug Knight was a danger. Shug Knight was only interested in brutalizing people, getting involved in music to brutalize people. And I just like filled my head with all this stuff about somebody I'd never heard about. Mm. And in no time at all, Shug suddenly became somebody that everybody knew because he made himself very known very quickly. Started off as a bodyguard as yeah. well. Yeah. He was on that bodyguard. Yeah. How was Snoop Dogg? Well, again, a really good story behind that because Snoop was away. Do you remember the murder trial? Yeah. I, I was, young boy, I was the only journalist to interview him. On the, it's like I'd gained such a good reputation for not being a hack um, and being a journalist who genuinely cared about the culture and about the music and about portraying it. And, you know, there was people who were so stereotyped typing about you know young black rappers that they were all thugs or they were this or that and, and a lot of the people I was meeting were far less thuggish or outrageous than white people I'd grown up with so it was like you know all the so it wasn't just the media who blew this up it was people like Shu who made much of this who used those stereotypes constantly to sell the music um but I just I so I interviewed Snoop when he was waiting that murder trial, which obviously he, because I can't even remember the details of it now, but that had involved another guy and there was some mistaken identity and various other things. Um, but he was hilarious. He was really funny because as he is funny. Was he smoking at the time? Um, he was. Every, they, you know, <laughs> lots of people did smoke around me. Um, and I took part a lot of time as well. <laughs> and uh, because... They weren't just like interviews. They were like occasions. Mm -hmm. They were events. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I just, I just feel incredibly blessed. Yeah, you must be, man. That's legendary. Yeah, to it's brilliant. Them. Absolutely no, brilliant. I don't think there's anyone else in the UK who's even interviewed one of them. Right. Or two of them. You've interviewed the full yeah. proper 90s and yeah. hardcore. Yeah. Crazy. But... What do you think of the Tupac and Biggie Small murder case? What do you think? Do you think it was corporal? Do you think it was planned? Do you think it was just... I think it was absolutely planned. And I think that, that certainly with um, with Tupac, it was absolutely the LA police involved, um, LAPD. Absolutely, no doubt about it. And um, um, Biggie, I'm uncertain. Jury's still out there. None of them should have died when they did. They both died prematurely. Um, and uh, And I just find it interesting that two hugely powerful young black men were killed in a place where many people were around, where cameras were everywhere. And yet, you know, years on, we still don't have the answer mm. to who killed these two men. So yeah. I find that quite curious. Yeah, but we know ourselves, we'll touch on all yeah. the other stuff like Epstein, the, the two security exactly. guards fell asleep and exactly. the cameras weren't working. So you've went from that era to then. Yeah. Being very outspoken about paedophiles, yeah. Jimmy Savo, you've got, Epstein, you've got Prince Andrew now, you've got the McCann case, which yeah. are massive one, you're very well known for. Yeah. How did you end up going down that route? Um, well, so my daughter was born in 1997 mm -hmm. and up, and for a little while, I carried on being a music journalist and I'd take her off to interviews with me and, you know, and, you know, artists would goo goo and gaga -ga with her. And mm -hmm. But there's only so much you can do with a baby, right? And the thing is, is I only have one child, but I'm a hands-on parent. And I was, was even then. And I didn't want to hand her over to somebody else to raise. So Is that because you were I, an orphan uh, as well? Probably, almost certainly. Mm -hmm. I was just like, you know, yeah. you know, I've got Don't to be there. Don't leave my side. Yeah. yeah. And some people did call me overprotective, you know, certainly when, when she was younger. Um, because I was very like, when people would say, can she have a sleepover? I was like, mm. yeah. do you know what I mean? I had mm -hmm. all those kinds of like issues yeah. and everything can, mm -hmm. can you go away on a school trip when she was seven no mm -hmm. you know and she was like one of the only ones in the class who didn't go away to, for a sleepover on a school trip when she was young because I was like I don't know these people very protective yeah and but it's not 
not done any harm. She's, you know, she's at university. She's yeah. leading her life. She's absolutely fine. But she knew that she grew How up. How well do you know with her? Oh, we, we're best friends. Do you still overprotect her? Do you still call every minute and uh, text? No, 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 not at all. I mean, she's home for the whole COVID mm. period anyway. Can you relax more though when she's home? It's really weird because... It's like I have total faith in her. Mm -hmm. Like she's the adult in our relationship a lot of the time, right? <clears throat> she's, she's 22 and she's yeah. like, you know, the grown up because she had a completely different background to me. So in some respects, I have some arrested development, you know, like mm -hmm. some parts of my life almost paused when certain things happened to me in my life. Well, thank goodness she's not experienced any of those mm -hmm. sort of traumas or anything. So yeah, yeah, hallelujah. Thank goodness thus far. You know, to my knowledge, yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you know what I mean? Because yeah. you just don't know, do you? Yeah, half yeah, the time, of course, of course. So, um, but I'm, I feel incredibly blessed. I feel incredibly blessed to be able to do the work I do. So, yeah. So, when she was born in 1997, I took her to a few things, but there comes a point when. See, the thing about music journalism is brilliant. You get to travel. You have a fantastic record collection, but you don't get paid a lot of money because all the perks are in the job. But obviously, once mm -hmm. you become a parent, you need money because yeah, you survive. can't you can't feed her a CD to eat, right? Mm -hmm. That's not really going to work. So I did it as long as I could. And then I was like, okay, I've got to find something else to write about. And the first thing that I wrote about was how um, silicon in breast implants were poisoning women. And because I just, it just that, that looked really nasty and horrible. And I just hated the way that women were deforming their bodies and not knowing mm. what they were doing to it. So that was the very first thing I wrote outside of music journalism. And things just started to take off. I started to do, I've, my thing has always been injustice, the underdog, obviously my background plays a huge part in it. Very lower working class background. I've never, you know, on paper, I'm middle class, but in my heart, I'm still that same working class girl mm -hmm. and I represent that as really important to me not to sell out in any way so injustices really fuel me you know I'm very motivated by letting voices be heard um and highlighting things that are wrong and so I just started more and more looking going into that I wrote well I've been a journalist now for 30 years I presented a program about AIDS for Channel 4 so I started to get some TV gigs and started to work on the Jeremy Vine show got loads of stuff on there and it just kind of snowballed and but all of it was the same theme it was all very much injustices mm? was it kind of on repeat all the time no on repeat yeah doing mm. the same thing every day no not really because that's the that's the great thing about my work is it's very varied mm -hmm. i need variety i cannot do things repetitively yeah. i'm not built for that right I mean, I've worked in factories and I've, I've made beds to make ends meet when my daughter was little and I'd separated from her father. I was a journalist and I was making beds in a hotel in the morning. I was serving in a bar. I was serving in a restaurant because I didn't want my daughter to grow up feeling impoverished in mm -hmm. any way, right? Because you know how you always want to improve things for your children. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure that she had the horse riding lessons and the ballet lessons and the swimming lessons. I wanted her to have all of that nice middle-class existence. Yeah. I just wanted her to have opportunities basically. Yeah. But I didn't have the income for that. And I wasn't earning a lot as a journalist at the time. We'd moved back to Gloucestershire from London when she was three, when I separated from her father, um, to be surrounded by, by our big family. And um, I was just, you know, earning any ways I could to keep things going, keep things ticking over. And, you know, I can't remember what your question was, but... <laughs> no, how did you get into the other um, flip of the coin when you'd done yeah. all the stuff that you'd done from hip hop? Right. And then raising your kid? Right. And then you've went and, right. and spoke about some serious, yeah. serious yeah. stuff. Was that always the plan for you to go down no. that path or did it just come no. out of nowhere? The, the more I started to get known as somebody who was prepared to speak out about injustices, whether that was mm -hmm. breast implants or whatever, or what the DWP were doing or what government was doing. You know, I was fighting against the welfare reform bill. I was fighting for the NHS to be better managed, all different things like that. So the more I became well known for being somebody who wasn't scared to speak up people would then come towards me and they'd say I've got something to tell you this has haunted me for 20 years and I was starting to hear more and more and more and more of what of people's experiences not everyone was true I've since found out not everyone was true because you know what it's like once you become a public figure all manner of people gravitate towards you not everybody has your best interests at yeah. heart but a lot of them were true and a lot of them had some validity to it and I started researching it and I just 
I've always I was raised anti-establishment anyway but what I was learning was beyond the pale right I suddenly started to see all the control mechanisms that took place how the establishment worked the blackmail that was taking place how children were used um were were being raped were used as blackmail between um secret services between politicians all this stuff was you know coming on my radar and I was like there's something I can't ignore this and so it kind of naturally gravitated towards that. I think probably the Madeleine McCann case was probably one of the first ones that made me go. Question marks. Something's wrong here. Because mm-hmm. the, the official narrative was, was ridiculous. It didn't, from the first day, I didn't believe it. I didn't believe that it was as straightforward as six doctors, there was nine there and six of them were doctors, would night after night continually go out and leave very, very young children. That was weird to me that doctors would do that. So that just sounded odd. So I... Mm-hmm. So I, I struggled with that story from, from the get goes, but I think that was probably one of the first stories where I started to unpack the official narrative. Yeah, because you're well, you're well known for yeah. the Madeleine McCann case. Mm. You still speak it to this day, yeah. which we'll touch on. But yeah. So when you started working on that, what kind of things were you trying to uncover? Well, the McCann case is a perfect example of a case that looks as if, a, if it's about one thing, but it's actually about many, many other things. And so it wasn't just about the case of a missing child who had, um, according to their parents and the Tappers Nine's own testimony, had gone missing through their own negligence. They, they, they gave us a neglect story that they left their children night after night when they went to the Tappers bar. And so that was, Madeline had been stolen because she'd been neglected. So, um, so I just thought that there is something wrong with that and I wanted to convey that to people because because it was clear to me that I don't like gaslighting, right? And I felt like right from the beginning that we were being gaslighted. So we had Kate and Jerry being put out onto these TV sofas and everything, portrayed as the perfect parents, middle class doctors, absolutely perfect. This was a, a you know a blot on their landscape, and I had a lot of problems with that because coming from my background. I knew how we were demonized as children. And I just thought if my mum had lost me in such a manner, Mm -hmm. they would have hung her from the rafters. The newspapers would have been all over her, you know, a working class woman, you know, and lost her child. But they didn't do that with Kate and Jerry. And I had a lot of problems with that because that just felt wrong. It felt like they were being received because of their very middle classness. And of course it was in part, but it was also, as we later discovered, the fact that they had some influences with with politics, um, the fact that politicians saw them as useful to use for their own agendas. And there were all these other things going on. And I saw people's freedom of speech being clamped down, Kate and Jerry using a multi-million pound fund that pensioners and little children had raided their money banks to send in to find Madeline. And Kate and Jerry were using this as a legal fund to stop people asking questions. So I had a lot of problems with all this, James. I was like, mm-hmm. they, These are not the actions of parents whose child has gone missing. They brought in public relations. They brought in image management team who, you know, were being paid from Madeline's fund. None of this is right. And I had a lot, a lot of problems with it. And I kept trying to convey this to editors. And I was, um, one newspaper got me to write um, an article. They wanted, because I was so incensed about what I saw as international People, people who had internationally neglected their children and were being treated as celebrities. And I had, I had a pro- lot of problems with that. And I said, if that was, you know, a black woman in a high rise flat, they would have slaughtered her. If it was a, a white working class woman, they'd have slaughtered her. If it was a single mother, they'd have slaughtered mm-hmm. her. But they didn't slaughter them. So a newspaper asked me to write an article conveying all this feeling. Anyway, I received a, I wrote it and I think it was about 800 words. And I received a call from this list to saying, we absolutely love this piece. I said, thank you. He said, but we won't be running it. I was like, okay. He said, we can't. Absolutely not. He said, even though you don't imply that uh, any of the people there have anything to do with the disappearance, you make it quite clear that the abduction is potentially a fake one. And we just can't run with that. And but it was all legal. There was literally nothing actually illegal they about could it. They could come back and get you sued or anything. Nothing. No, like that. no, because the way it had been worded was very clear. That all I was saying was that that I was asking questions because other people were asking questions. That's legitimate journalism. Mm-hmm. You can ask questions because other people ask questions. In fact, you should. You should be representing the public. It's a public interest issue. When the public are so involved with it, when you know. 
whoever it was, Branson, Rowling, they were all put into, you know, lots of money into this multi-million pound fund for one child when one child goes missing every day. So to me, this was a public issue that we should examine. Anyway, that piece never ran and that was it for me. I was like, something's wrong here. Then I wanted to do a documentary and I work in mainstream, as you know. And so I went to a number of producers and one producer said to me, Sam, love you to bits, but that's one story you don't do. Are they scared? Absolutely petrified. Petrified because the McCanns were using Madeline's Find Madeline Fund as their legal fund mm. to stop people asking questions. The newspapers were making a lot of money as well. They, every they every, fr- every were. front page story, they were, the numbers were going through the roof. Absolutely, so they were. So if they lose that, then the numbers drop as well. So they use all those stories. Yes, they did. They mm. used Madeline in abhorrent ways, actually, mm-hmm. James. They, you know, they would pick up rumours from Portugal, just rumours, and they'd run with them. Really awful stuff with no care or concern. And the thing is, I consider myself a journalist as opposed to a hack. It's really important to me how the people at the centre of a story are impacted. I'm not talking about corrupt people. If it's politicians or anybody else like that, I will go after them full force. But if you're actually talking about a sensitive situation that perhaps involves survivors or whatever, I want to know what my intervention will eventually mean for them. How will it impact them? That's important to me to leave people vulnerable. No, not to leave people vulnerable. It's important to me that when I deal with vulnerable people to leave them in better shape than I found them, Mm -hmm. right? Not to leave them in worse shape. So, you know, there's all this stuff that's like kicking in. But when the moment I was told that's one story that you don't cover, that to me was, that's it. Red flag. Gloves are off. That's Mm -hmm. it. It, This is the story I must cover. And definitely lost work through it. The first documentary we made, which was the McCanns and the police, examining the relationship between the McCanns and the police. They've had a relationship with now four police forces um, and I, so I examined that relationship what it actually meant what influence the McCanns had had on police what things that the police had refused to investigate that had been taken to them and um, and what was interesting was the year before I we'd released that documentary and it's as in the second documentary we made, I think I had approximately 54 TV and radio appearances. So that's, that's, that's more than one a week. Mm. And that's, you know, we, we, you know, we're talking BBC, ITV, you know. Or the mainstream. All over. The year after we released a documentary, I didn't even have one. Zero. Big fat zero. That to me was evidence that, that I had done something wrong. Yeah, not done something wrong. ruffled feathers. I'd really ruffled feathers and that's continued to now. Mm-hmm. And and I've since found out that that was absolutely true. I was removed from certain programmes. I was removed from This Morning. Um, I was removed from Sky until there was a change of personnel and the guy who was keeping me out because he had been involved with a lot of the Sky coverage. Mm-hmm. And when he went, I then came back in again. So because obviously personnel shift and change all the time. But um, there are TV companies to this day which are still invested in the abduction story and it is in their interest not to have me on. Yeah. Uh. Jeremy, how much pull did, then does Jeremy can have? I know he worked at Celtic's boys clubs as well. He did. Celtic boys club is yeah. one of the biggest paedophile rings. Absolutely. There's been, I think there's been six people in prison now. Yeah. Stem back from the 60s and the more light they get shed on it, um, the more shit that's getting uncovered. Yeah. And I know he worked there. I'm not saying, I am not. don't know what he did there. Or yeah. He was a doctor there, but I don't know if he was involved yeah. in any of that shit. Yeah. But how much power do you think he has that, has he got any power that he's closing down these interviews and because I know there's so a lot of people as well for speaking out against yeah. him um, how well connected is he well I mean that is the eternal question we certainly know that before Madeline went missing he was involved with a government board which was looking at clean air um, and uh, on that same board was Gordon Brown's brother so there's a connection straight away there um, the day after Madeline went missing or it was actually several days this is what, this, and this is the thing is this story is intriguing because there's so many component parts to it that you just have to go, whoa, it's really weird. Madeline was report. I always say reported missing because we don't know that she definitely went missing on May the 3rd. So I always say reported missing because that's accurate. Was there a homicide reported though for Portugal police at the start? Was it a murder they were looking? No, they were looking for a missing child. Yeah, they were looking for a missing child. May the, th- well, actually. The Portuguese police, I think, struggled from the very beginning believing the abduction story because as soon as they went in, the crime scene had been contaminated. The McCanns and their friends had been all through the crime scene before the police arrived. Other people had come in from the 
holiday resort trampling all through it. And for doctors who know about forensic evidence, again, I found that extraordinary. But one of the extraordinary twists and turns for me was... So that was May the 3rd when Madeleine was reported missing. On May the 4th, the very first TV broadcast about it was on... It was GMTV, Good Morning... Uh, yeah, Button. yeah. Good morning. No, we're not. No, that that's what it's now morphed into. Mm-hmm. But then it was GMTV, and the editor was Martin Frizzell, who is now the editor of This Morning. And um, they said that a call came through about a missing child, and they put it straight through and put it onto air. And that was when we first heard about missing Madeline. Um, and what was really curious was the woman who came through was a friend of Kate's, and she also claimed in that week. She actually lived in the same street as Gordon Brown's, one of Gordon Brown's brothers. And she claimed in that week to have bumped into him and said, you know, these are friends of mine, they need help. But all of that is so extraordinary. Do you know what I mean? What's the Mm -hmm. chances of Kate McCann's mate living in the same street as Gordon Brown's brother? Do you see what I'm saying? All of this stuff is like... Question marks of the world. And that's why people, this is an intriguing case, even down to things like the apartment that they rented in Prada Luz. It was owned by a family called the McCanns who weren't related to the McCanns. Even stuff like that. And it's mm-hmm. always intriguing, isn't it, when you fall upon those sort of things and go, there's strange synergy yeah. taking place here. What's this all about? You know, so, and that's what that case is like. And it's one of those cases where one thing can be a bit off, right? But we're not talking about one thing. Mm-hmm. We're talking 20, 30 things, you know, that all kind of keep adding up and keep stacking yeah. up that make you have to go, this story is not as told. Because when he was getting an interview with Jerry, <clears throat> he's so calm and collective. But again, is that because he's a doctor and he's been through, seen yeah. so many dead bodies yeah. as well? Because we've still got to question it. Is there 100% proof that they were involved? Or right. is it just people were, were experiment hunters, were always searching? It's, yeah. It sounds like people like to hear bad shit as well as the yeah. good. Where yeah, yeah. We could be wrong. Yeah, we, we could be wrong. I always, here's the thing, James, I'm open-minded mm-hmm. because I think you have to be as an investigator, yeah. right? You, I am I am fixed on something until something arrives to, to tell me that Otherwise, I have to question yeah. that. And then I will. I'm not arrogant. I will question that. But what I will say without a shadow of a doubt is that there is a great deal of evidence to suggest that Madeline died in apartment 5A and that, her body was disposed of in some way rather than evidence to suggest an abduction took place. Mm. And so I'm just going on the evidence. The Portuguese police released Mm. their files. There was a lot of information in there. It was quite clear that the Tapas 9 were not answering truthfully. I mean, who needs to do two rough timelines about what you're doing when a child's missing, which they did do, right? Change their statements. Witness statements changed. All really weird, peculiar stuff. Right at the beginning, knowing you're going to use this fund for legal fees. Why? You've got a missing child. Surely you'd be using it for travel fees. Do you know what I'm saying? Go find her. The dog that was involved as well, was that the best dog in the world for he, sniffing out dead bodies. Eddie and, and Keela were the creme de la creme mm-hmm. of enhanced victim recovery dogs, right? This, this Martin Grime we're talking about. Anybody has to do a Google search. If you want a dog handler, we're talking Martin Grime. This is a man that the FBI used to put away people in the States when they couldn't find bodies, right? So Martin Grime was the top. And Eddie and Keela were exemplary and they went and they alerted to only the places to do with Madeline. So they went in all the apartments of all the people who, the friends who were there. They alerted to the apartment where Madeline was reported missing. They alerted to a key ring that was in a hire car that Kate and Jerry had hired 28 days or so after Madeline had been reported missing. They alerted to Kate's trousers. They alerted in the new apartment that the McCanns had been moved to away from the crime scene. They didn't alert anywhere else. They didn't alert. So to me, it's like all these dog alerts are where either around her parents, around her family or where she was reported missing. Dismissed, well, but they said that the the evidence, they didn't say the evidence was wrong, they said it was inconclusive and it needed more. Um, And there were problems at the Forensic Science Service and and what we have now is Dr. Mark Perlin, who is a world-renowned expert who has come out, offered to do, to re-examine that DNA for free, contacted Scotland Yard, where Operation Grange, which is the British investigation, they're not interested. Yeah. Do you think Madeleine McCann's dead? It, yes. Do you? Yeah. What time did did she was she not like reported? Was it not like hours later before they contacted the police when well, she went apparently went missing? Well, they tell us that the their first 
notification that she'd gone missing was at 10 o'clock when Kate went back to the apartment to check on them because obviously their story was that they went out every night to the tapas bar across the swimming pool their apartments there tapas bars there and they said that them and their friends went out every night to have dinner at the tapas bar they went back every well that even changed well I think one minute was 15 minutes it was half an hour but either way they said they went back regularly to double check on the children that already was a problem for me right I mean we've just talked about me being an overbearing parent right yeah. so the idea of going off on the lash leaving your little babies that to me immediate I didn't like these people from straight away I was like these there's something off about these people um but you know it, it's just, it's always been an intriguing story to me it doesn't add up um and like I say, my mind is open. If anything, if any information, I get information all the time. I actually got a call yesterday with somebody who swears to me that they saw Madeline in Peru, right? So what have I done today? I haven't ignored it. I've been straight on to somebody, a contact out there saying, what is the likelihood that, because they, they said that Madeline was with a particular person. I said, what is the likelihood that this person was in Peru? I gave them the dates. And so I'm I'm willing to... So you're still investigating it as well? I will always investigate. Mm -hmm. If you come to me and you sound legit, I'm not... Some people come to me and sound, to tell me crazy stuff, which I, my solar plexus rejects straight <laughs> away. It's like, I'm yeah. not having that. But if somebody sounds legit and they give me all the details of when they were there, what... Ha Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know. Because there's a lot of allegations that said the kids were drugged because, you know, on a holiday, kids don't yeah. sleep. So if you're putting... What time did apparently put oh, the kids yes. to bed? Oh, yes. So, so the time, so basically, so the... The, they said that they went off to the tapas bar at 8.30 and then they were coming back periodically. And what they claim was that Madeline was first alerted to be reported missing at 10 p.m. And Kate went running back. And again, she's gone running back. So so you're saying there's a predator that's taken your oldest child, but you've left your twins who were young in the apartment that you're... Mm. Who would do that? When I've been to the scene of crime twice, she could come out on the balcony and go, Jerry! That could have happened. You don't need to come back out and run back up. No. Mm. And that was odd to me. Again, those instincts were really weird stuff. So that was at 10 o'clock. The police log shows that the police were not called until 10.41 when they claimed that the police were called immediately. That was not the case. It was So it was at least 41 minutes during which time people traipsed through the apartment. The crime scene was a mess. Yeah, contaminated. Yeah, contaminated. Yeah. Have there other kids ever came forward? Why have they never been seen? Or the other people who were at the hotel with them, why have they never came and spoken about any of this? What, all their friends? Yeah. Well, this is where it gets tricky, of course, isn't it? Because, I mean, it, hypothetically, let's, let's, do it, let's run a hypothetical situation. Let's say that something did happen to Madeline that they're all aware of. Well, I've talked to a lot of, you know crime investigators about this how do you manage to get hypothetically all these people in a group to agree to go along with your lie right so so th i think the most common theory is that they were drugging the kids so that the kids wouldn't wake up and the theory is that madeline was half dozy when jerry came in i think at 9 15 heard his voice outside talking downstairs to a tv producer who was also holiday in and fell off the back of the uh, sofa possibly hit her head that's where the blood and cadap and possibly died behind the sofa i think that's one of the most common theories about what happened to her um and uh so i sorry i keep going off on a tangent with you James. Okay. my mind is yeah, like there's, okay, there's so man. much mm -hmm. there's just so much about mm -hmm. this case it even to this day it boggles my mind yeah. because it's so insane it's just so insane mm -hmm. so much of it just doesn't make sense doesn't add up so um, yes, yeah, so they had that period when they, they didn't do anything. But so, yes, yeah, so the crime investigators that I've talked to, because I'm really curious, how couldn't all nine people be involved in a secret, right? And keep it all this time, yeah. 13 years later. Actually, it's quite common. It's quite common. Because if in the event that's what happened, don't forget all those other adults would have also been cl complicit to a certain degree because they would have known that the children were being given cowpol or whatever it was to make them drowsy. They might have even been doing it to their own little toddlers, right? So they're all complicit. And in that that situation who knows just say hypothetically that they they found her dead body even doctors don't necessarily know what to do with a dead body that they're not prepared for do you mm. know what i'm saying yeah. so that's why I, obviously investigators are always interested in the immediate those those immediate 24 hours what took place there and there's a lot of clues in that yeah. they as i say they did two different timelines they couldn't remember jerry couldn't remember whether he came in the back door or the side door mm -hmm. it was really weird stuff yeah. that just didn't make sense but they were changing it it would appear according yeah. to mm -hmm. the story they were given because one minute the 
abductor mm-hmm. would come in the window the next they're uncertain yeah you know. i've seen people doing interviews on the tv who's lost their kids maybe kids have went missing or kids have died and they look distraught right and just because they did an interview and people saying question marks it doesn't mean you're guilty right. but for me there is something suspicious about it all yeah. what's your rundown on it all what is your theory with the information you have what is your theory about all this the situation between madeline mccann my theory is that madeline died in that apartment that her abduction was um that it was a, a, essentially a faked abduction. My theory is the same as the Portuguese police. The Portuguese police haven't really changed. That was their original theory. And when they archived um, the case, they didn't archive the case. They made Kate and Jerry Arguido, which is persons of interest in Portugal. Um, and they, that's, there's a legal protection there, obviously, because it protects them in case they are then prosecuted. Um, so they were made Arguido and within de- they said they were never going to leave Portugal until they found Madeline and, it was either the next day or within two days of them being made our guido, they were back on a plane and back to England again. Um, and the Portuguese police um, believed very much that Madeline died accidentally in the apartment and that was concealed and an abduction was faked. And, uh, and I tend to, everything that I've found, all the information tends to back up that theory. I don't, I definitely don't believe she was abducted. Mm-hmm. I definitely don't. Yeah. A lot of people have got question marks. I know a lot of people still say leave them alone. They've lost their kid. I get it. I understand, of course. But do you ever think, listen, the truth always comes out in the end. I don't care what it is. The truth always comes out. And it is with this, you see. It's really interesting because when I, so bear in mind, right from the beginning, I didn't believe this. That's 2007, right? That's 13 years ago. I've seen how the tide is and because this is the thing about truth is that truth will surface whether you want it to or not you know that because bit by bit uh, you know as we start to gather more information and sort of acclimatize to to what has come towards us so we were fed a very very strong narrative right they went out every night they they were returning and there was a small window in which madeline was taken so very very specific narrative well once I had unpacked that narrative and realised that didn't stand up to scrutiny, then it was, well, what else could have happened to her, right? So I never, I'm I'm not the person to heap problems on top of people, right? That's not my aim. But I believe that this is, well, I don't believe, I know, this is a matter of public interest. Um, in the UK, we've spent £13 million on a crime that didn't even happen in this country. We are not looking at the people who were there. In any missing person case, especially a missing child's case, they look at the people who were around the child first. British police have systematically avoided doing that. Colin Sutton, who I interviewed for both our documentaries, who was the senior investigating officer for Levi Belfield, who killed Millie Dowler, and ITV made a programme on Colin. And Colin was a very, very senior Met Police cop. Brilliant man. I interviewed him. And the News of the World, before Operation Grange started, which is the British investigation into Madeline, shortly before it started, the News of the World, which was still functioning then, ran a story saying that Colin Sutton was in line to lead Operation Grange. Colin Sutton, he says it's on record, it's in our doc. He received a phone call from a very senior Metropolitan Police cop saying, don't do it. And Colin said, why? And he said, you won't be able to investigate it how you would want to because Colin's a a straight cop, right? Mm. He's a straight cop. So I said to him, well, how do you interpret that? He said, I won't be able to look at the parents. So Operation Grange started off from a very narrow remit and that's backed up by Andy, can't remember his surname, who was the original investigating officer of Operation Grange, saying that neither the parents said this in the press conference to a launch Operation Grange, neither the parents or the friends are persons of interest. That's not, that doesn't sound like a legitimate investigation if you are immediately before the investigation starts ruling out the very people who were there. Do you think they should do a lie detector? And I, put some speculation to bed? Uh, well, I'm not convinced by lie detectors. Mm-hmm. I work with a man called Terry Mullins. He's got eye recognition now. The first one is, is kind in the UK. Oh, wow. Eye yeah. recognition. Yeah. What does that do? It just, I don't know, it reads the eyes. And oh, you my can't, God. You can't hang me. So I work with Terry and we've got something coming up, something very big, but... These are the kind of names that, listen, it's, it is still speculation, but if you're innocent, tend that speculation, then you would think, 
I'm going to prove everyone wrong. See, I don't know if I would mm -hmm. because I don't trust lie detector tests. Yeah. I get worried about them, right? <laughs> because I worry about, yeah. you know, if you get anxious or yeah. I, I'm... But this is the, the I, I know people say you can feel it, you right. can cheat it. right. But with eye recognition, it's spot on. Interesting. You know what? What I think they should do is I think they should go right back to the beginning. I think that Kate and, cause Kate and Jerry were and their friends were never prepared even to do a reconstruction. They've never done a police reconstruction, right? Obviously, Kate infamously refused to answer 49 questions pertaining to the disappearance of Madeline. And these are not the actions of parents who... They've lost a kid. Yeah, they're not. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, when you look at the other side, which I always do, I always try to, she was le legally advised by her legal rep not to answer questions. But James, my child's missing, right? There's no legal rep in the world who can shut me up from giving information to the yeah. people who are potentially looking for her. I'd be, and also the fact that Kate didn't even search for Madeline. I mean, that's weird, right? Mm -hmm. Your instinct, you're in a, you're in a holiday um, resort, your child goes missing. I'd be ripping the sand from the beach. Mm -hmm. But she stayed in her apartment. And then when there was criticism, she admitted in one of the first interviews and when asked, you know, why didn't they go searching? She was like, well, we did loads of other things because they were busy setting up the business mm -hmm. and arranging all the business apparatus to yeah. protect. You're only totally shut up if you're hiding something. Yeah, well, it's problematic to me. How were you treated then once you started trying to get answers? How, were you, how did other people treat you at the time? Well, um, on the surface, at, at distance, you know, I mean, people in my profession, like mm -hmm. journalists yeah. and people like that. Uh, on, at a distance did you become like a, not a threat but yeah, yeah, she's yeah. a bit out there and yeah. take back from her because people can potentially lose their job their yeah. livelihood persona non grata that was me yeah. yeah and I still am though because I tackle the subjects quite deliberately and I, when I mean deliberately it, I tackle the subjects that mainstream won't I will look at things that mainstream won't I was in a, an article for the journalist magazine last week which is the National Union of Journalists magazine so it's the magazine for journalists and they um had approached me about talking about the whole gender debate and the issue about how we should be reporting on this issue and so and so you know i'm i'm a responsible journalist i don't just you know push out crap I, that's not what i do do you <laughs> yeah, know what i'm saying yeah. i'm not a hack mm -hmm. it really is important to me that people are afforded dignity and decency in this world unless you're not. If you're not dignity, if you're not decent, then I'll come for you. Mm -hmm. If if you are in any way abusing people or using public funds, if you're surrounded by that protective layer of public funds, f funds whether politicians, local council, I'll come for you. I don't care. <laughs> I'll come for you. So you become a threat for people then. Well, I don't know if I'm a threat, but I'll well, exposing people and people who are high in power, of course, yeah. because. You become well. She's she's like a scalf. She just yeah. doesn't go away like a fawn on the side. Yeah. How do you think? Because I know you spoke out about genders yeah. and stuff like that, yeah. and transgender yeah. and the um, drag queen yeah. story. It's drag drag queen story time. Right. So let's talk about that. Because I know you're right. very outspoken about that. Yeah. Yeah. But what I'll just add to that is that the, there have been really mm -hmm. worrying times. I was wired up to the Metropolitan Police for over three years because I had a stalker I had many stalkers and over a period of one year alone there were over 2,000 posts on Twitter wanting to set me on fire bury me in concrete rape me mm -hmm. I mean just mad stuff case failed 15 days before it went to trial at Kingston Crown Court and my head stalker several days after that was given a core participant role in the child abuse inquiry mm -hmm. so it kind of tells you yeah, so what's going on? when did that the threats really start to hit home then? Oh, After the Madeleine McCann stuff? Yeah, the big th no, the threats really started 2012. 2012, when I started looking into the whole issue of paedophiles in Parliament after the Jimmy Savile revelations, that's when the threats really started. Mm -hmm. We found out who it was, you know. And did you know them? I didn't know them before, but I, I got to know them, obviously. I, mm. I did know the guy. I did know the guy and actually had been friendly with him. He'd been at a care home in North Wales. But he'd been part of the problem. Mm -hmm. He'd been one of the older boys who had selected the younger boys to be abused. So he'd managed to keep himself out of the fray, but, mm -hmm. and he was selecting the younger boys. Do you tend to see the people who target you are paedophiles himself or some sort of... He was a child rapist. Yeah. He had been involved in the gang rape of a child when mm -hmm. he was in the care home himself, when he was an older lad. Yeah. Um, but yes, there is a, absolutely a strong theme. Um one woman targeted me for four years and her brother who um, 
stayed with her sometimes. She lived, I think she lived in Holland. She's a British woman, but lived in Holland. She would invite child abuse survivors to come over and stay with her. And I found out her brother also stayed there. And it, her brother raped a woman so bad, gave gave a date rape, Rohypnol, raped a woman so badly, she has got a colostomy bag for life. So these are the kind of people who were after me, you know, they were after me. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I just wanted to, because it's not like, I'm running free here, right? I do mm-hmm. have people after me. You only have to Google my name, see the defamation about mm-hmm. me. I was accused of the murder of a survivor. And one woman filmed herself taking an overdose, saying it was because of me. She wasn't actually taking an overdose. She was actually eating sweets, but she was did it in such a certain way. It looked like it was tablets. She filmed that. That was put out all on social media. This is terrible stuff to have said yeah. about you. Really terrible How stuff. How did that affect you then? Deeply. I, was, I went down. I had a very, very difficult few years, to be honest with you, from about... I was actually quite ill. Um, 2013, I say about from 2013 to about 2017 was a very, very dark period. I'd had a breakdown when I was 30 and I'm 55 now, I think I am. I can't remember. Um, But I'd had a breakdown when I was 30 and over the last few years, I thought I was going to go there again when all this stuff piled in. Did you ever think about taking a couple of steps back and just going down? Yes, the straight route, the people pretending that they yeah. don't see or hear yeah. anything. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I did try. But I, I think couldn't. that's against your will. It like was. you say, you're too much of a fighter to yeah. go. Because I, I don't agree with that. Like people who know what's going on, but they choose not to because they're getting a wager. For me, they're part of the fucking problem. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? This is the thing, right? Is that we've all got to earn a living. Yeah. We've all got to earn a livelihood. It's just how we choose to do it, mm. right? Now, some of my colleagues, they live in very, you know, decent, big, big houses. This is a little terrace house, but comfortable. Really grateful. Don't get me wrong. Really, really grateful to have it. But I don't desire splendor. I don't desire fast cars or riches. Do you know what I'm saying? Those things are not important to me. The truth turns me on, literally. Uh, I'm like, you know, and I don't yeah. mean sexually, but do you know what I mean? No. Well, it depends, I suppose. It depends what kind yeah. of truth it is, really. But do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like it motivates mm-hmm. me. It's like... Yeah. I find it's truth exciting. Of course, man. And when people talk truth, you know it. You can connect with it. Yeah. So even though I did momentarily pull myself back, I said, okay, I need to start thinking about myself, about my health. At one point, the doctor diagnosed me with 14 things wrong with my body. Because obviously your body takes a toll. If you're going to carry on doing the same things and you're not listening to all the messages that you've got to pull back, mm-hmm. your body takes the toll. And so, Is that because of the stories you were hearing as well? Like, Yeah. When you did the paedophiles of parliament, is it paedophiles of parliament or paedophiles? Paedophiles in parliament. In parliament. Um, like you uncovered a lot of big names. Yeah. How did that, that documentary come about? Why did you go down that route? Was that after the Madeleine McCann yes. stuff? Yes. Well, that was because I had, the evidence was irrefutable to me. It was quite clear that there had been a cover up in parliament that there had been some high profile names that children had been taken to had been taken from care homes transported in sunshine coaches do you remember the sunshine coaches yeah. they used to use for disabled kids mm-hmm. they were taking kids from care homes on these sun, sunshine coaches dressing up seven and eight year old boys in little fairy costumes taking them to places like dolphin square you know, I, I'm in no doubt that they took them to um, Elm Guest House, which became most famous of Cyril Smith there, Leon Britton, a number of other people. Um, we said Cyril Smith was definitely there, no doubt about mm-hmm. it. Obviously, a pedo politician who was, you know, abusing and raping children um, in Rochdale. Um, but it became increasingly clear to me that There was one story that could be told in mainstream and one story that everybody was acting as if it didn't. So they were going so far in terms of the paedophile allegations after Jimmy Savile, but they weren't going deep enough. They weren't prepared to really go in deep. And I was getting increasingly frustrated. And I just said, sorry, I'm going to have to do it. I have to do it myself. So um, that's exactly what I did. I sat down. I... um, I've never been... I'm not computer savvy, but I had learned to edit and use Final Cut Pro because I was so desperate to tell a story. To tell the truth. Had to be told. How bad was Jimmy Savile? It was bad. I mean, this is a man who had no, there was no filter to him. There was no barriers or boundaries. Children to necrophilia, you know, yeah. this, this is a bad person. This is a very, very sick So how individual. does a man like that, a DJ, 
work with the, the royal family. Surely he would have been vetted, or done background well, checks. Well, exactly. My point, exactly. And, and and the same as with his relationship with Margaret Thatcher, you know, he was... She was an evil old bastard. Oh, man. absolutely. I, so I, was she covering up paedophile rings and everything? Deeply, though. Yeah. So deeply, though, because... Peter, How deep? Deep. Peter Morrison, who was her right-hand man, right, um... Uh, her protection, royal protection officer, not royal protection, her pr- close protection officer went to her and said that, that Peter Morrison is rumoured to be having weekend parties with young boys at his Cheshire home. Gave her information. What did she do? Promoted him. Um, and, you know, the Tory cabinet, McAlpine, right? McAlpine was rumoured to be going to North Wales care homes, having boys delivered to his car. And he was very clever. When the whole McAlpine thing came out, I don't know if you remember, it was Newsnight and um, Lord McAlpine, who was then alive, obviously, and he was, I think he was the Conservative Party treasurer at the time. There was, so there were these accusations and um, Steve Mesham, who had come from the North Wales care home, had gone on Newsnight and had identified his abuser and said it was he didn't Steve didn't actually say Lord McAlpine but the inference was that it was Lord McAlpine people talking about on Twitter and various other things well he came Lord McAlpine came crashing down on that people getting sued on Twitter it was like anybody who tweets this I mean it was like so scary um and then obviously lots of people um and then ITV ended up paying him I think it was like 127,000 pound because Philip Schofield had handed over a list which had had his name on which somebody had said that you could potentially see his name but basically she was protecting all these people in her circle absolutely and Jimmy Savile is a perfect example because what we we know was that he stayed with her for many years at Chequers, which obviously is the official resident of the British Prime Minister, and he would go there for Christmas, at least on 10 occasions. Some people say it was as much as 12, 14 occasions. So, you know, I mean, this is... Is he the level on the kids, do you think? I mean, I believe he was the procurer of the children for various Mm -hmm. people, certainly. There's absolutely no way on earth... Could you have got that close to royalty as he did and that close to politicians as he did without being vetted to within a, a, an inch of his life? So he was vetted. He would have had to have been vetted. Of course, man. 100%. Yeah, it's yeah. ridiculous. But you hear people saying, the celebrities saying they already heard the stories about him. So you try to tell me the royal family didn't know. Yeah, exactly. So, like, the Prince Andrew scandal. Yeah, when he did his interview, why did yeah. he do that interview when it yeah. made him just look guilty? Yeah. Was he was he so pushed into a, backed into a corner that he had to do it? No, I think that's the arrogance that he's grown up with. You see, these people believe they're completely they're untouchable. Than everyone else. Yeah, they can outwit everybody. He and, came across as a fucking idiot. Well, the problem is he's not bright. Yeah. <laughs> these people are not bright. I mean, a lot of them are educated beyond yeah. intelligence. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? They 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 they, they were they were afforded a good education, mm-hmm. but it's beyond their actual yeah. abilities, and they they aren't bright. I mean. Or ever be? Can he ever get brought down? Can the FBI? Are they just totally? I mean, look at the shit show. I mean, look at what's been going on. Yeah. I mean, he should have been questioned long ago. How is this? Now we but, know that he, he inter. Well, we know this anyway. Yeah. That he interfered with their legal system on behalf of Epstein. Right? Him and um, Glenn Maxwell. Mm. Th- they were the friends, Andrew and Glenn. Yeah. Right. So it's ridiculous what he's been allowed Can to get he away get with. Can he get charged though? Has the royal family got I, too much power? Well. I think legally he probably can be charged. I don't know. The jury's out on that. I don't know. I yeah. mean, obviously the Queen can't for anything. The connection between him and Epstein, how strong was that? I think it was strong. Yeah. I think it was it was a lot stronger than he would want us to believe, obviously. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you hear of, of what Virginia has to say, Virginia was obviously the one that um, Prince Andrew allegedly raped. Um, and I have to say allegedly because it's, we're in that territory. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know if you've seen Filthy Rich on Netflix. No. Well, that was a, that only told like quarter of the story. But basically, oh, with Epstein, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, seen that, yeah, seen but, that. but only because it doesn't go into obviously too much detail. We are talking about an international paedophile trafficking. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's like they, they were like a corporate industry, weren't they? And that's what's been protected, and it continues to be protected. I don't want to leave this earth, James, until people like Prince Andrew have been held to account. Right, mm. that's my thing. Is yeah. that I want to see people who should be held to account, held to account, yeah. and then I feel that I can step off. But I feel as if it's people are waking up. Yeah, I think people thought it was just a conspiracy theory. Yeah, Prince Andrew, yeah. Epstein, Bill Clinton. Yeah, um, now you've got Hollywood. Yeah, 
you've got guys like Tom Hanks, who, which I've heard he was on tag in Australia for being a paedophile. Right. He was on tag and it, it pretended to be in quarantine for right. coronavirus. I mean, I've heard this as well, yeah. but do you give it, do you give it credence? Do you? No, not yet. Not right. yet. But I believe a lot of, listen, if a lot of people say it, then potentially yeah. it's becoming there because you've got to get old Liz. Who's the one that done Out of the Shadows? Uh, Out of the Shadows. Liz i done pizza gate and oh yes yeah yeah um, Liz um, uh, Crookin, Crookin. Yeah, yeah, yeah 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 so she's going deep yeah so she is yeah with um, she's calling out John Legend's wife right who's apparently Chrissy Teigen yeah yeah um, that's been ongoing and, that, and the thing is is that some of these I mean it is possible and this is the thing this is mm-hmm. me this is the journalist coming in now it is possible that some of those people went on those flights legitimately not realising yeah. what was actually taking Just place there. Go on holiday. Yes, mm-hmm. that is absolutely possible, yeah. right? So I allow for that as well. Mm-hmm. I don't automatically say everybody on Epstein's flight log is a, is a pedo going yeah. off to Epstein's island, right? So I allow for that. Mm-hmm. And it is possible that, that Chrissy Teigen may be one of those. Because certainly she's not having it, is she? Mm-hmm. Like out of everybody, she's the one who's fighting it the hardest. She's she's really like yeah. challenging what's being but said about her. some of her tweets about kids and... It's very perverted. Uh, oh, I, and this is where I have a problem. Mm-hmm. This is exactly where I have a problem. Who was the guy? The Was it Masters of the Universe? You remember that Disney guy? Do you read some of his tweets? No. I think he was to do with, is it Nexus? Is that how mm-hmm. it's pronounced? Not that sure. sort of cult. And um, well, I could have had, I could have that wrong anyway. But mm-hmm. a lot of these people, their tweets are really dodgy. Who, who tweets this kind of, you know, and then they, they go, oh, that was like 10 years ago. Yeah, you were, you were 28. Who yeah. tweets that? You know, so I, I know what you mean. Yeah. Very dodgy stuff. How- True as the Satanism stuff, the flesh eating, adrenochrome. I, I, I don't know. How true is that? Is that conspiracy theory? I, I honestly don't that, know. A lot more people are starting to speak out about that stuff, yeah. but are they doing it just for attention or is it true? Because I've never spoke to anyone who, it's all speculation. Yeah. Nothing's concrete with it. Yeah. It's, um, well, I've talked to people who believe categorically that this happened to them. They, they you know, but it is, how, it is difficult. It is really, really difficult to know. And But the thing is, you have to be careful because sometimes things are so far out that they lend themselves to being denied anyway. But but we shouldn't automatically dispute something just because it's beyond our usual imagination. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because these people aren't like us. That's the thing. Is mm-hmm. I, and I have encountered Satanists. They're not like me. They think and do things that I would never consider. And this is where the problem is, James, is when you have decent people who generally don't want to harm other people, they find it hard to put themselves in the shoes of these abusers, of these very sick people who drink blood and do all. It's impossible. It's so hard for them. But, and that's why you have to be careful not to dismiss it just because it sounds too far out yeah. there. Yeah, well, they say adrenochrome, adrenochrome, adrenochrome. Yeah. For anyone who doesn't know, they say when they torture kids, the pineal gland releases this and it's right. the most expensive drug in the world. Right. They say, people are saying in Hollywood, they've been drinking it and right. makes them feel young, fitter, fresher. Yeah. But again, it's all speculation. It is. It, it's just, isn't it like hydronized adrenaline? Isn't yeah, that what it kind like of that. is? But right. Again, you see all the videos and you can go right down the rabbit hole, but yeah. I'm not too clued up with it all, if I'm honest. I've seen an old video and it, And it's scary, but it's also intriguing to even go, wait a minute, is that true? Well, that's part of the appeal. And Mm -hmm. that's, again, where we have to be careful. We have to be careful because the thing is, is that we can be busy looking for lizards Mm -hmm. or we can tackle the people who are right in front of our faces being abusers. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? It's maybe a deflection. Sometimes I think think it's... but it's also intriguing, you know, this stuff is hard to listen to. And sometimes people feel the need to tack a little bit of this in onto it, jazz mm-hmm. it up this way. I don't. I think the truth is compelling enough. Mm-hmm. You know, any of these situations, you tell the truth, it's gobsmacking. Mm-hmm. You don't need to dress anything up. Now, so, but I want to be clear here. I'm not dismissing what people are saying. I just don't know the truth about yeah. what you've just, I don't know the truth. Mm-hmm. And so... I like to keep an open mind. Subject, as I say, subject to new information. I like to keep an open mind. It's not beyond my understanding that these people could be using something in order to be able to rejuvenate themselves, in order to be able to refresh themselves. And this is ongoing anyway. Mm -hmm. This is what they do in Hollywood. The Kardashians, not one of them have the same face they were born with. So, you know, this is how Hollywood functions. They're constantly doing stuff like this. But Hollywood is, I I think... There's a lot of shit that's going to come down. Yeah. I believe there's so much out there now and people are starting to wake up and yeah. realise, right, okay, there's something I miss here. Yeah. 
Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton. Yeah. How deep are these into like They're paedophile deep. rings? They're deep. I mean, they, they, I don't know about paedophile rings, but I do know that they are they are very, very deeply mm. in this. Clinton is going to come off so bad through all this Epstein-Maxwell stuff. I don't think... I mean, having said that, we were discussing this on a live stream I now do on Saturday nights with Sean ha Yeah, Atwood. working on Sean's yeah. channel. You've yeah. also got your own YouTube channel, yeah. so Sonia yeah. Pilton will leave the, the links you. as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, look, again, I've gone off on a tangent yeah, no, here. So you're saying about Hillary and Bill Clinton? You think it will come down in Bill Clinton? I think they're the biggest that are going to get it. But but whether we're going to be able to bring them down or not, because these so powerful. these crime families, yeah. right? They're crime they families. The world. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And, it, and it's not just about them, right? Hillary and Bill, as themselves, they're expendable. But it's who they're associated with. It's who else has bought into what it is they've done. So that's why they remain protected for mm. ever while they're still here. They're filthy. We know they're filthy, even going back to their early days in Arkansas. Mm. You know, there's a dead body count around them. We know this, you know. And uh, I don't know about all the Podesta stuff. I don't know if there's truth to that. I, I can see why people would believe it, because these are people who even just, even just a cursory knowledge of them, you know something is wrong with them. Your soul tells you something is wrong with these people. And that's why a lot of the time rumours get tacked on because we already have a bad feeling about these people. But perhaps what reason we have a bad feeling about them is because they are legitimately corrupt. They are legitimately child abusers, but they might not be Satanists. Mm -hmm. And while we're busy focused on them being Satanists and drinking children's blood and everything, we're not actually dealing with the reality. Do you see what I'm yeah. saying? And that's, I'm always about bring it back to the reality. Yeah. Can, you, can you put somebody in handcuffs? Can you put that... Or is it just a theory? Yeah. Is it just, you know, five people ruling the world that we'll never be able to put in handcuffs? Or can we put people who are prepared to stand up mm -hmm. and put... Like for me, many people say, quite rightly, Boris Johnson has very little power. But as far as I'm concerned, he's prepared to be a figurehead. So if, the, if there's something involving him, take him down. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If you're prepared to be a figurehead for these because you're being paid handsomely for it... You've also got to be culpable. Might be missing, actually, the people who are truly pulling the strings, but we get the people that we can. We get them. Yeah, but if you, you look through the years, no prime minister or president has ever no, went to the jail. No, I watched one of your videos and you were talking about Bill Clinton, the Monica Lewinsky thing. You yeah. says that was a, a cover-up, a deflection. I've, yes, yes. And that, and that was from great contacts mm -hmm. who gave me that information. And it was complete. And the reason why I believe it is because it was so contrary to what everybody else had known about it. I have no doubt that she was having a, you know, a, a, a really affair. affair. Yeah. Well, but I, he's had many. Yeah, exactly. But you think that was a deflection to get, get away that it was a child? Well, and that's where it got child. interesting for me because we've always known that Bill Clinton is a ladies' man. That's how he's been portrayed. Remember the whole Hillary stand by your man thing and everything. And that, what I was told, and actually it's followed through because now we know all about the Epstein stuff. And I was told this a very long time ago before any of that came out. And what I was told was that it was far preferable for him to be seen as somebody who would chase a bit of skirt of an adult woman, even if she was like late teens, but at least away from... Because if he's seen as a ladies' man, then he's not seen as buggering children or anything else mm -hmm. that he may be doing it complete and it worked it worked everybody saw bill clinton as a ladies man but very few associated him with children or underage children or underage mm -hmm. people right but now they do and so, that was a long time ago i was told that and that was by those were brilliant sources who told but me they'll still control a big part of the media yeah those in power yeah the hillary clinton emails as well yeah. how true are they well they are true i mean the mm -hmm. ones that were leaked by WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. They are true. And she threw out that whole campaign. And uh, I mean, she was weird. Do you remember on the several occasions when she appeared to have glitches and stuff? Yeah, like, do you remember twitching, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Weird stuff. Mm -hmm. And like that on that one occasion when she was getting into the car and they all surrounded her because she fell back. And then the following day they came out and she said, I'd have my flu shot. Don't know if you remember that. No. That was quite interesting. Well, if, 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 you, if, if you need any further reason not to have a flu shot, sure. watch that video, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So... These people are professional mm -hmm. at covering things up, right? They're professional. These are not moralistic people. I don't believe anybody who gets into the White House is moralistic any more than anybody who gets into number so 10. So why do you think they get to the top? Do you think that they've got dirt on them that if they 
don't follow rules, they'll use it. Like presidents, prime ministers, that it is, all seems to be the same families. It all seems to be in the bloodline, well, exactly. all sort of connected. Exactly, it is the same families over mm-hmm. and over again. You know, it's this soupçon, isn't it? Yeah. You know, same families, but they are all in it together to a certain degree because they come up through. The, I mean, Donald Trump was slightly different, obviously, because he'd never been a, a politician, mm-hmm. and he sort of bought his way, obviously, into being in the presidential yeah. race. Um, so he was slightly different, but he was still all part of that same set. I mean, he was he was as matey with Epstein as as the rest of them, yeah. you know. But it, but I mean, I felt I think I think the Trump campaign was quite genius because they managed to portray him as a man of the people as he stood in his gold lift. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? This yeah. is genius stuff mm-hmm. when you're able to to manipulate people. People are so easy manipulated, though. What do you think of Trump, though? Because a lot of people are saying now he's one for child grooming gangs for exposing Yeah, I know that, they do. Putting the, the border around Mexico to stop kids getting imported. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people, kids have gone missing. The numbers have come down. He's one that's yeah. behind trying to expose Hollywood. Is that real? Is it bullshit? Or? I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know. I've, I've, a lot of people portraying him as a good guy. Yes, they, they do. And I have a lot of problems with that mm-hmm. because the, these same people who fight to the death for Trump and attack people like Maria Farmer, who's obviously one of Epstein's victims. And uh, like... Last Friday, for a perfect example, I see Maria Farmer being attacked on Twitter, right? And it was all to do with Trump because she's saying, no, he's, he's, you know, he's as responsible, right, as anybody else in all of this. But the same people who want to believe that Clinton absolutely, Prince Andrew absolutely, they don't want to believe Trump. And this, the, a lot of people are very party political when it comes to child abusers, right? And a perfect example of that is Tommy Robinson. Tommy Robinson is only interested in child abusers if they're Muslims, for one example, whereas I'm interested in nailing all child abusers. I'm not party political, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not party political. I'm not culturally biased. If you are a Muslim grooming gang raping children, get you. If you're white middle class part of the establishment, get you. I don't care. But the so, so Tommy Robinson is the same as these people who are defending Trump but want to nail Clinton. And it's not, it's, like, it's almost like they're not really interested in child abuse. They're interested in pushing their political points. Mm-hmm. And that's problematic for me. Trump is, to me, part of the problem, far from the solution. Um, I know I've heard all about this, you know, to do with Mexico and everything. But, um, not Mexico. It is Mexico. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, and rescuing children from the, the from the cages yeah. and everything. But this is all rumour. Yeah. And who is starting this? These are very powerful machines around it. You know, we know that there are people online who were set up specifically to Promote. maintain all yeah. this kind of work. Mm-hmm. Right? So, me, I don't trust anything until I've been able to flesh it out as much as I humanly can, drill down on it and find mm-hmm. out as much of the yeah. truth as possible. And I have not reached a conclusion about Donald Trump. Not yet. yet. Not yet. Glenn Maxwell, she seems to be like the modern day Jimmy Savile. Yeah. She seems to be the, another one who yeah. brought the, the big wigs, kids, yeah. Yeah. the paedophile rings. Where does she come from? I know our dad was major and... Um, major. So Robert Maxwell, Robert Maxwell were, yeah. owned the... Trinity Mirror mm-hmm. Group, which was obviously the Daily Mirror, Sunday Mirror, Sunday People, loads of other media enterprises. He, of course, was the bastard who stole everybody's pensions. Um, he was said to have uh, fallen off. I think the late was it the Lady Ghislaine, the his boat, and died. I think everybody knew that it was odd death, very odd death. But she comes from a crime family essentially mm-hmm. you know almost all of her siblings are involved in very very dodgy stuff i found out something the other night again on this live stream with sean from charlie robinson which was absolutely brilliant which was about Ghislaine maxwell's sister isabel and how she was involved in event 201 the round table event to do with the um gates foundation which was saying a coronavirus pandemic was coming that they mm-hmm. did last october and the maxwells are involved in that sort of stuff do you know what i mean they they have their fingers in lots of pies they're a crime family Glenn was very much a society girl um you know she'd gone from the UK to New York a society princess mixed with sort of the elite very very wealthy people but really whereas Jimmy Savile was a working class northern DJ who did that she was a upper middle class society girl who was almost certainly procuring children basically the sort of female equivalent of Jimmy, Jimmy Savile yeah so 
The inform- do you think she'll get killed? Do you think she'll be a suicide probably the it, next few weeks? Do you know what? Living in the world that we live in, I have to say it's possible. Yeah. I mean, it's. I, I can no longer say categorically you can arrest a high-profile person and they're going to survive. Yeah, because they say Epstein had videos of high-profile names, uh, presidents, prime ministers, Hollywood actors, where he had videos and he was going to expose it all. Yeah. And then eventually when he did, it was on a 24-7 suicide watch. Yeah. Two security guards fall asleep. Yeah. Cameras don't work. I know. It's never heard of I in mean, his it, life. I mean, it's phenomenal, isn't it, Do you it, think really? he could still be alive? What if they hadn't killed him? But, uh, do you think he's dead? <laughs> oh. What's or like, do, or do, possibly he's got that much money, so many contacts, he's got his fucking islands. The, here's the thing, right? Again, if you'd have asked me the same question about a similar situation maybe five years ago, I would have said, no, of course he's dead. Don't be ridiculous. Mm-hmm. That's just conspiracy theory and doesn't help anybody. But we live in a world now where the levels of corruption are so deep. It, Nothing surprises it, no. you. No. <laughs> and I think that's the best yeah. place to be in now. It doesn't mean I'm gullible, yeah, of course. but I have to allow Question for these that you have to. Yeah. You have to because they've lied to us so consistently, mm-hmm. right? Whatever it's about, whether it's about coronavirus or vaccine, they lie to us constantly. Mm-hmm. They don't give us factual information. And so we are forced to question narratives constantly and find out invariably that many, many narratives don't stack up. Mm-hmm. Official narratives don't stack up. So for me, what you've said, I have to allow for the fact that he could have been picked up and what, carted off to Israel because they, you know, Maxwell, Maxwell family were very, very much involved with Israeli intelligence. That was their heart. They were very clear about that. Um, and so... You know, and what everybody has to say that with mm-hmm. any knowledge is that both Glenn and um, Epstein were involved with Israeli intelligence. So who's to say? Who's to yeah. say they aren't somewhere being protected? How connected was Glenn? How deep is the paedophile rings that they were involved in? Epstein and her? Well, I think deep. I is think, there a lot of... I, I, I know there's a few girls came forward. Well, we're talking about... We're talking extensive. Mm-hmm. We're talking, that's, and that's, again, why the Netflix doc is really like... It's like... 3% of 100, do you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. it's not to take anything away from it because all highlighting is good, except if it sets a certain narrative. Because what the mm-hmm. Netflix doc leaves you is with this idea that for the most part, the young females, they were they were not children. They were- 16, 17. Yeah, yeah. it was kind of like, and some of it I had a bit of a problem with because these were schoolgirls. Mm-hmm. These were schoolgirls, right? They were they were grooming these schoolgirls. They although Netflix did say all of this, they were sending bouquets and stuff to it was like a young girl at school who was picking out her mates to go off and you know, so but this is much more extensive. This is an international child trafficking mm-hmm. organization. So those stories of those mid teens, late teens, young females, that was just like Palm Beach in Florida and New York. These people were traveling all over the world. Mm -hmm. They were having young people and children supplied to them. Of that, I have no doubt. And I truly believe that Galen was absolutely instrumental in this. Mm -hmm. I do. I mean, allegedly. Yeah. How many kids go missing each year in the UK? Oh, I mean, it's actually difficult to put a, a number. And the reason why is because... We have the rough idea that one child goes missing every five minutes, okay, in the UK. But but a, a significant percentage of, of those children return within 24 hours, mm-hmm. then within a week. So it is actually very, very difficult yeah. to get a final number. Well, going missing and coming back because I've had Barbara O'Hare on my show, who's a good friend. She was in Aston Hall. She wrote the book, The Hospital. Right. So the doctors there were all paedophiles. But what they used to do is have a checklist um, kids from broken homes, kids from addictions, kids who've already been abused. So what happens is when they sign them into the mental institute, once the kids run away and try and tell the police or whatever, the police didn't believe them because they're sent away as crazy and they take them right back. So right. there was a checklist. What happened is in Aston Hall, they were drugging the kids, experimenting on them, killing them. And this was going so deep. But again, all these connections can be from high profile doctors, yeah. politicians, yeah. Barbara says people used to drive up in their fancy suits, big yeah. cars, yeah. take away the kids for a couple of days and take them back. And that's key what she just said there. And that reminds me of the point I was just I was going to say to you about Lord McAlpine, because when he came out with this statement that he wasn't a paedophile and all these rumours were terrible, the wording was very clever. I have never been inside a care home to pick... No, mate, you, you never needed to go inside because the boys were sent out to your car. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It was all very clever wording mm-hmm. that was, re, was, yeah. was used. Yes, yeah, so this stuff is extensive. Mm-hmm. We know this is extensive. Yeah. 
you know, care homes have been an absolute hell for children. Yeah. Still to this day. Yes. Still to this day. Yes. Used to take photos of the kids, get in and put them in a catalogue. And then the catalogues used to get passed about all the major MPs, all the high profile names. It's fucking sick, man. Terrible. It's sick. Terrible. Yeah. And it makes me feel murderous, James. I mean, the thing yeah. is, is that I try and keep as balanced and mm-hmm. equilibrium as possible. But sometimes people say to me, well, what would you do with paedophiles? It's really, I, I honestly don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't believe in the mm-hmm. death penalty, first of all, yeah. right? So, because you can get that wrong um, and you can't come back I'll from that. I'll put it out there, but I believe in it, I believe it. Because I had a friend on Terry Ellis last week who was a bank robber, but he'd done 16 years. He went to Grendon, Grendon which is one of the, the most ruthless prisons where paedophiles and they try and work on their mental health. Right. They say it can't be fixed. Right. Once you're attracted to a kid, it can't right. be reversed, yeah. it can't be stopped. Like addiction, coke addict, gambling yeah. addict, you can't stop yourself. But yeah. for paedophiles, they can't stop the thoughts yeah. of it. So for me, the best, because they tried castrating yeah. paedophiles in America. But it didn't fucking work. No. They started using other tools yeah, or exactly. to abuse exactly. kids. So for me, death penalty, definitely. But would they bring the death penalty back if politicians are involved? Potentially because they could end up getting right. killed themselves. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean? yeah. I mean, I, I'm not coming from that position, but where I am coming from is they would have to be removed completely from society. Yeah. We can't allow them to be walking amongst mm. us. You know, Barry Ben, or perfect example, paedophile footballer, you know, extent, we're talking hundreds of kids, right? And they just, uh, he's just admitted another nine charges on top of the 50 that he's already serving time for, right? Mm. Yeah, could you ever trust that man out and about amongst yeah. us again? Do you know what I'm saying? They say one in every 30, though, has paedophile tendencies. It's frightening. So that's one in every street. There's one here in this street. I think we've got to have, I think this is, we're getting tricky territory now right and because i think this involves a major major conversation that we actually have to have and um, not necessarily you and i but mm-hmm. but the world because we need to be honest here and that is men many men i would say the majority of men who are straight who are attracted to females are highly attracted to youth they're mm-hmm. attracted to youth yeah. right which is why like britney spears remember when she came out in all her school girl yeah, uniform yeah, that yeah, really yeah, took yeah. off it's that mm-hmm. whole thing isn't it mm-hmm. the sexualization and men are very attracted to that and a lot of it is it, it's perfectly natural because obviously a young female mm-hmm. in full bloom she's fertile yeah. this is a natural instinct but we have to be honest mm-hmm. about how many men are attracted to young girls and we're not honest about that. Do you think the age of consent... Well, the age of consent in Britain was 12 in the 1800s. Right. 12. Do you think the age of consent at 16 should be maybe taken to 18? Or do you think it's okay right. the way it is just now? Difficult. I wouldn't raise it, but I definitely wouldn't lower it either. Mm-hmm. And I've actually spent the last probably 10 years from one TV and radio debate to another up against people who are fighting very hard to lower the age of consent. Yeah. They've all got the same agenda because obviously if you lower to the what age... what age? 14? Oh, no, some people want the age of consent to be four. What? <laughs> Fucking hell, man. What country is this? Uh, UK. No our, way. Our, our nation, yes. What? I mean, this is not... If you look at the people who are involved in the paedophile information exchange, which was most... Um, had most of its power probably from the 70s onwards, 80s, 90s. They had funding from the Home Office in the 90s. Mm. Those people are still around. In fact, uh, one of the members of the paedophile information exchange is um, the treasurer of uh, Edinburgh Pride. What? Yeah. So these people are still around. These people are still around. Yeah. And uh, they're, they're still in our environment. They're still bringing pressure to bear on reducing the age of consent, right? And some of them are academics and they look very, very, you know, professional as they're talking about the importance of you know, giving children their own autonomy. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but uh, no, so I would keep it at 16. I mean, uh, arguably, neither male or female, certainly females are not ready really to have, to deal with the emotions that come with a sexual relationship mm-hmm. at 16. That can be problematic. But You're I, still growing as a person. You're exactly. You're still going through changes Ex- and hormones. You really yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I would raise it to 18 though, but... But, um, but porn's 18. Hmm? Porn is 18. Porn. Is it? What, is there a different age for... Porn and sex, yeah. Is it really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, how so interesting. So porn's 18, and, but you can have sex at 16. Right, 
Right. I mean, me personally, I would, I mean, as I say, I've done one debate after another about this yeah. and some of the people I've gone up against and you have to wonder what their agenda is yeah. when, when they're prepared Anybody to Anybody that it wants out. it younger than 16, there's got to yeah. be an agenda that they're a fucking yeah. paedophile themselves. Absolutely. Well, you only have to look at somebody like um, Peter Tatchell, right? Who's very well Who's known. That? Peter Tatchell is a very, very, very well-known campaigner and he was originally involved with Stonewall and a lot of LGBT rights. Well, Peter Tatchell is most famously uh, famous now for talking about how sexual relationships between adults and children isn't necessarily harmful you know i'm paraphrasing him but he's going into schools and talking to children about sex education yeah. right and this is somebody who is pushing constantly pushing mm -hmm. and these people are pushing to create more vulnerability for children because obviously if it if it if if you can reduce the age of consent, then these rapists can rape these children and it's not illegal. Yeah. So it's obviously, it's all about, you know, and, and anybody who tells me that a child, because the whole big push in schools at the moment is to do with queer theory. And that's where a lot of the information is coming from. It's an academic principle, which believes that children have their own agency. Well, no, actually children yeah. don't have their own agency, right? Children cannot consent to sex mm -hmm. at six, right? Same as transgender, the, the male and female... Some kids are getting operations as yes. young as 10. Yes. Why? Well, you're here. Listen, I believe be who you want to be. And if you feel you're somebody else in somebody else's body, listen, as long as you're not hurting anyone, do what you've got to do. But if you're younger, a young kid who can't make their own choices, then I don't agree with that. Well, this is a massive issue for me. I mean, I've spent, we, I, I have a production company. So we spend a period of time building up different films so we have two films which have been building up over a period of time our most recent one is about the whole coronavirus thing but we've had a, a gender transgender doc which has been ongoing since march the 1st 2019 and that, that was the first day that i filmed a court case or rather the end of the court case which involved a transsexual called miranda yardley and miranda is um great miranda is a man and is absolutely perfectly well aware that he's a man and that will not will probably be quite insulted if you start trying to call him she or her or anything and has fought for the the fact that people can be whoever they want to be but biology still is biology right i'm if i'm dead and they dig me up you're still going to see i'm a female right no matter what i do to my body externally right it's just the way it is so i've had a lot of issues with the whole you know transgender agenda and just to be very clear i come i come from a hippie family i've you know, I've come from raving in the 80s. You know, I'm perfectly used to calling men sister or girlfriend. None of those are an issue to me, right, James? The issues to me are where we are now. And that is we're in a place of compelled speech where it's become a legal issue now if you misgender. So if I, ref so if you suddenly announce to me today that you're a woman and I refuse to refer to you as she or her, you can report me for a hate crime and I will be, that will go down as a hate crime. So that to me is bollocks, right? Because that's compelling us to, to, I mean, we've never had a situation ever in this world where, because they say this is a civil rights issue. No, it's not. Because there's no civil rights movement that has ever demanded that I ignore the evidence of my eyes. Right. And that's what this 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 is doing. And it's very, very dangerous. And the last two years have been really problematic because they're trying to push through a law to do with the Gender Recognition Act in which you can self ID. Now, what we are discovering is that more men than women are choosing to self ID and that literally not changing anything about themselves, but saying they're a woman and demanding access into women's spaces. We're talking the female estate in prison. Right. So um, Karen White, man suddenly becomes a man, gets in the female state, is a sex offender, you know, sexually attacks the women in the female state. So I don't know what you do or don't know about women in prison, but like men in prison, we are probably talking about some of the most vulnerable members of society. I don't need to tell mm -hmm. you this. You know what I'm talking about. We're talking about incredibly vulnerable people. You yeah. don't need a rapist who claims to be a woman put in with the women and then mm -hmm. so he can rape freely. And this is what's happening. Men are getting access to women's refuges, women's sports, we're suddenly setting new records for women. No, yeah, mate, you're agree, a man. Yeah. I don't agree with all that well, shit either. Neither do I. Yeah. So I believe in people absolutely being able to express themselves, people not discriminating. We should be much freer. If you want to wear a dress, wear it. It's not mm. an issue, right? We shouldn't have any issues like that. Men want to wear makeup. But where we are now, we have a gender lobby, Stonewall Gendered Intelligence Mermaids. This, these are three organisations that are very dangerous and detrimental to young people. Mermaids alone, which is the gender 
um, organization for children, the CEO um, took um, her 16 year old son to Thailand for an operation that was illegal in the UK and is now illegal in Thailand and came back with a daughter. Right. And that's the CEO of Mermaids advising children about being transgender. And that's Starbucks. Starbucks um, uh, created a cookie. Yeah. And uh, I can't remember, but it's like 149 yeah. or whatever. And um, they are, I think it's giving up to it's either 50,000 or 100,000 to mermaids. Anybody who gives to mermaids, I'll say it straight. To me, mermaids is a child abuse place, right? I'm, I, Susie Green goes after people. Susie Green is the CEO, CEO. She goes after people who have said that, but I don't give a shit about that, James, because these children are being indoctrinated. Once you, it, it is now shown quite clearly in studies, once you start children on puberty blockers, they hardly ever go back. But if you don't start them on puberty blockers, right? Puberty blockers, obviously, it's not pausing their puberty, it's destroying them. Doctors are now a 32, I think it's 32, staff from Tavistock, which is the clinic that's doing this, have left over the last three years saying children are being put on a conveyor belt, being pushed through this system. Right. And you have to ask why. Well, there's a lot of money to be made. And then when you start to look at who's pushing these agendas, some of the most powerful men in Hollywood have become women. The two brothers who made The Matrix, they're both women now. Right. So these are, are. Yes. Chris Jenner. Lily. Yeah. Lily and I can't remember their names, but they're both, they both claim to be women. Of course. So they wrote The Matrix are. are uh, uh, the, right. uh, people watch the Matrix as well, and they're so ingrained right. and think right. it's the truth of right. the world. Right. Well, both those brothers now. What are they? The was it Wazisky brothers or whatever? Mm -hmm. but you, people can trace this, but they're both now claimed to be women. So these are incredibly yeah, that's rich. That's fine anyway, but it's absolutely why do you, fine. Why do you but think they're then? part of the agenda? You see, and yeah. when I say part of the agenda, because they are. This this is this this will show you this 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 is one sentence which tells you everything. So this this whole thing that's been going through Parliament about, about whether people could be self ID and have it recognised in law. So there's been a lot of, you know, people have come out against that. I've campaigned against it. Lots of people I've worked with, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We're waiting for the results of that now. They've delayed it because, and this is why they've delayed it, because all of a sudden, Google, Disney, NBC, major. American media broadcasting companies have petitioned the British government to introduce self-ID in this country. What the fuck are these major American media com com companies doing getting involved in British politics, mm. right? And that's what I say is because there's powerful people involved in these organisations mm. and that's what they want. They, they want to create... So what do you think the outcome is then trying to promote this all the time, like Bruce Jenner, sex changes? Absolutely. What do you think it's for though? What do you think the well, outcome Well, obviously will be? some people talk about transhumanism mm -hmm. as one example, but I think it is to create this sort of society where there's... Well, first of all, it makes it incredibly vulnerable for children. It makes it incredibly vulnerable for women because if you can't name your sex class, how can you have any laws around it? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Look, don't get me wrong here, James Wright, and that is not every man is a rapist, but the vast, vast, vast majority of sex crimes are carried out by men. Vast, 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 vast. So we need to be able to name that in order to be able to solve it. But now we're getting situations, crime stats, where men are being called women and it's going down as a woman's crime. A friend of mine made a video called These Are Not Our Crimes, available on YouTube, but it's an 18, so people have to sign in. Shows, I think, approximately 72 men who claim to be women after they were, after or during, they're committed for mm -hmm. very, very serious crimes. You cannot, we cannot lose sight. Do you think it's a loophole then? Who, it's a massive loophole. So, again, what was I, so this, in America, I think, so for paedophiles, they're trying to bring a law out that, so if you're um, gay, straight, whatever, they're trying to bring a law out that if you're attracted to kids, then it's just, a sexuality. A sexuality. Yeah, no, no. We is can't, that true? We, we can't be, well, that is, there's a pressure for that. I don't know whether that's actually a law, but there's a pressure for that. And that is definitely taking place. And what they've mm -hmm. done is they've, they've normalized it. They've increasingly normalized it. And there's a couple of issues that I have at this moment. And that is, I don't know if you're familiar with MAPS. MAPS is the rebranding of paedophilia, minor attracted person minor attracted people. These people are all over Twitter. You can be a map on Twitter with, and actually I can, I can show you, I can show you accounts where you put in your biog the age range of children that you're attracted what? to. It's on Twitter. I'll show you. You can do that. You can have conversations about the 
uh, the sexuality of four-year-olds and how they're a bit too young for you or a bit too old for you. Mm -hmm. You can't recognise biological sex on Twitter. If you say a man is a man and a woman is a woman, you're getting booted off because plenty of people have. But you can be a paedophile. So there's a number of things that there is pressure. That's like I say in this... All these people are all part of, some, mm -hmm. they're part of pressure. Lower the age of consent. Rename paedophiles as maps. And now what we have is academics who are giving talks about how paedophilia is a sexuality. You've got TED Talks on this now, right? So they are normalizing this. Mm -hmm. And obviously, the moment that you make paedophilia a sexuality, you're in trouble. Because yeah. think about all the protections that come with sexuality. We absolutely do and must always protect people who are heterosexual, people who are gay, people who are bisexual, right? You must protect people's mm -hmm. sexualities. You don't start protecting child abusers. Yeah, do you think that's right? the route they're trying to go 100%. down? 100%. Do you think so? I think 100%. I don't think people are, are as much as the, the world can be manipulated and people can be manipulated with news, I just hope that people stand together with I that. hope you're right. Do you know what I mean? But people are so manipulated. People are so easily brainwashed. They call TV a programme for a reason. It right. programmes your brain. Right. Is this the start of down that route yeah. to protect those because they know it's coming on top I, the elite paedophiles know it's fucking coming on top it's stealth as well remember that yeah. it's done by stealth if we suddenly went we want paedophiles to be mm -hmm. seen as a sexuality out of nowhere nobody's having it but the more you introduce different things drag queen story time where you bring drag queens in to read completely odd stories to children that they you know dressed up very sexualized twerking for children you're constantly yeah, you've lowering spoke out boundaries about, you've spoke out about this, uh, yeah you're not anti-drag queen you're not no anti, no no, no. I've, yeah. again i've grown Channel up people i've got friends yeah who are, you know i'm I mean? all good with yeah. that yeah i know momentarily um, but your opinion on that is you think they're doing that to sexualized children okay. lower the boundaries yeah, yeah. it's all part of the same mm -hmm. thing it's all part of the same movement but for drag queens as well there's more there's probably more like teachers, there's there's so many paedophile teachers yeah. that you don't know, but they're not drag as yeah. well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So how do we pick and choose yeah. what's right and what's wrong? Well, and this is the difficulty because what if we've learned anything over the last 10 years is how much adults, paedophiles gravitate towards children's pursuits, whether that's children in sport or whether it's schools or whatever it is. And it's really awful because I love children. I love the energy of children and there are lots of people like me and people like me who love children, love to be around children. We're now in this place of, uh, you know, I don't want people to have those mm -hmm. ideas. Do you know what I'm saying yeah. about me? And, that, and that's, that's awful. Yeah. Cause Myra, is it Myra Black? Or the one of the MPs from oh, Glasgow. Oh, Mari. Mari Black. Yeah, I mean, don't even get me on she, her. She get fucking slaughtered. And she deserves so to. She, did. she deserves She was to. only one in Scotland, I think. Yeah. She referred to women who question self-ID as Jeremy Hunts, yeah? You're an MP and and you want to you want to start to rather than ask why are we saying this? And here's the odd thing, they want to try and portray the women who have come and men because men have joined this now because obviously women were on the front line of dealing with this suddenly men who are calling themselves women and wanting to, and look at what's happened we can no longer say that women have cervix i mean rosie duffield an mp has been piled on over the last two days on twitter for saying that only women have a cervix because we now have to say individuals have a cervix but we don't have to say individuals have a prostate we can still say men have a prostate why because it's men it's transgender very powerful transgender men at the top of this heap who are pushing to erase women they want to erase women because they want that validation i'm a woman that's mm -hmm. this is what's going on yeah so do you think there's the um, it's all planned for the first step making everything sound as if it's okay and then yeah normalizing everything yeah. People think it's okay. So when things, new laws do get put in place, people don't seem to bother as no. much. And people don't. And the problem is most people are on the hamster wheel, right? Mm -hmm. We, you know, whether it's a nine to five or however you work your life, but for the most part, people are earning and having to spend out and just having to keep going on a continual rotation just to stay in the same place. So a lot of the times people don't have time to look into this in any great detail, but this is my job. Yeah. My job yeah, is to look yeah, into yeah, this yeah. stuff in great detail. When you started doing the BBC stuff, I know you spoke about the statue because yeah. all around the UK this year, statues have been getting ripped down yeah. and rightly so. Some yeah. of them, yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But 
The one at the BBC, can you talk about that? Absolutely. That's that's an appalling. I did a recent video about that. Seen that? That's the one I watched today. Yeah. And that video was, oh, I can't remember. Who's the, remind me of who did it. Uh, Eric Gill or something. Yes, um, uh, that's it, Eric Gill. Yeah. Now, Eric Gill is, was a, a pervert artist. And of, after his death, I think it was at the end of the 80s, his diaries all came out to the, and it became clear that he'd been having a long-term relationship with his sexual relationship with his sister that he had abused both his children certainly um and he painted his children the nude and all awful stuff like that well that is the man who created the statue which stands at the entrance of broadcasting house you've got the radio part it's actually the radio part that it's and but behind that is the main bbc now because obviously since it moved over from west london it's now in in central london and that that Eric Gill statue is of, um, I think it's Prometheus, and but but the point is, is it's, it's, it's an image of a little boy, a nude boy, you know, you can see his little penis, with a man, and we now know that the man who carved this was a paedophile. The BBC, with its history of covering up paedophilia, right, Jimmy Savile was not a lone wolf in all this, right? Couldn't have been. You, For that degree to have been enabled, we're talking about a huge enablement that would have taken place. And we know that anyway. We know that, you know, children talk about producers who pushed them in rooms with them, all manner of stuff. We know all that was taking place. But the BBC has a outrageous history of child abuse. The very, that statue has to come down, James. Because that statue, you walk down Portland Place and it's the first thing you see. And it literally is like some sort of tribute to the paedophilia that has taken place in that broadcasting, you know, building. And so, you know, that, to me, that has come down. And that is a scary thing. It's so thrown in front of your face that in people don't... In plain sight. Yeah, and people don't... In plain sight. Yeah. One of the things you spoke about, which interested me because it's my hometown, well, not my hometown, but I'm very close to it, was the Dunblane shooting. Oh, dear. From Thomas Hamilton, right. 1996, where 16 kids were killed. Yes. You spoke a lot of detail. There's more to that story there is. than first thought. and I was very intrigued with that. Yeah. Can you explain this? Well, see, now this is where I consider myself incredibly blessed because I've built up a, a reputation for having integrity. I do have integrity. That's important to me. So people trust me. And I've had um, two young, actually my, three now, I think, who were all in classes with Thomas Hamilton. And they talk about how they were, they were young boys at the time um, because he used to run like sports clubs and everything. He always did everything he could to, again, to be near young people. And he'd do things like, you know, make them take off the top and their top and run around like bouncing their little boys with their little nipples and do you know what I mean stuff like that and he'd make comments on them and he'd do all that kind of stuff so I, I, I've managed to gather a lot of quite rich information from people who were there so Thomas Hamilton what we knew about him was in even the files that came out after the shooting anyway so as you say 16 children and their teacher killed I think 15 were injured he was also dead. He was somebody who had a huge interest in guns. The story of Thomas Hamilton has yet to be told. His files are sealed for 100 years. Um, we know that he was a soci He was a highly likely that he was a paedophile. Certainly he had paedophilic interest, no doubt about that. But he was also, uh, it would appear that he was very associated with people in like um, Scottish um, establishment as well as the British establishment and um, one of the military schools that he was associated with well Prince Philip the Queen's husband was the patron for ex just one example um, there was a great deal of rumours about involvements to do with Tony Blair um, but uh, Thomas Hamilton the official story obviously is he went into Dunblane lost, lost his mind killed these children and their teacher um, turned the gun on himself. He did turn on the gun on himself, mm -hmm. didn't he? Yeah, turned the gun on himself. And then, of course, what then happened is we then had the new gun laws. So Thomas Hamilton's act brought in the banning of handguns in the UK. Quite significant, eh? Yeah. Um, and uh, and as I say, the files sealed for 100 years. It's not uncommon for files to be sealed. 75 years. That, exactly. Now, that is the most common. And sometimes they get doubt, but they're not downgrading this. And so there is obviously the suggestion that we are talking about people in both the English and Scottish elite who 
are named in those files and who are being protected in 100 years time we're not going to be They'll here be dead are we? anyway. we're done yeah. so why did it why is that allowed to keep files for like 75 years 100 years well is that a big ma- major cover-up as well for well, well it, it's not supposed to be and actually mm. again i always try and find well what would be their rationale for that rather than just look at it as being conspiratorial mm-hmm. try and find the rationale for it sometimes it does bear out now you've got to Sometimes there's information in these files which could compromise our national safety, individual safety of people. I understand all that. Makes absolute sense. But when you're talking about a situation like Thomas Hamilton, where the perpetrator is dead anyway, right? Um, This is of national interest. We should all know exactly who he was associated with, you know, because, look, I'm not saying that you can always judge a man or woman by who they associated with. Because I, I don't always think that birds of a feather flock together. You know, I, sometimes I could have a picture taken with somebody who I've only known five minutes, but that picture could go down. Everybody could say she's known that person forever and they're this. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So sometimes it's quite difficult. Sometimes you end up in the company of people who are unsavory and you don't necessarily know that and you get caught out. But we are talking about a man whose actions not only blighted the lives and devastated the lives of children and families, but new laws were enacted because of him. This is serious. Mm-hmm. This this should this impacts us all. We should know the details of it. So it's a curious situation, but I'm still receiving more information about that. And I do you hope, think MK Ultra was in play there? Well, some him? people do say that. Some people do say that. And again, we should remember that that is a legitimate thing. You know yeah. that the CIA used to use, and and that is a legitimate program that has been used for yeah. many decades. Not, it's Barbara not impossible. Barbara O'Hare again says they use that Aston Hall. They used to use MK Ultra, where they controlling the mind and right. telling the kids what to do, and they were forcing the kids to walk off cliffs. Right. I mean, none of that surprises me. Yeah. It doesn't surprise me, and I wish it did. Mm-hmm. I wish I said, "Get away with you." That's Do you ever get scared that the stuff that I'm not too deep into all this stuff because I'm going to be honest. I don't really know enough right. about it to be as honest. Why is that? Do you know what I mean? It's, um, I don't have all the information. But when you do start speaking, I do speak to a lot of people, but it's nothing concrete for me. Right. But the information that you do get, it doesn't mind fuck you. Yeah. It becomes draining, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, it do you does. Know what I mean? To see all this information it and people does. are so 95 X Factor on a Saturday night, bottle of wine. Yeah. But when we're hearing all the other stuff, like I spoke to Barbara O'Hare, Stephen Smith, who was the boy in the cellar who also went through it at Aston right. Hall. Because I've got kids myself and you think, fuck me, man, did this stuff yeah. really go on? Yeah. We, it's scary. Are you a survivor yourself, Sonia? Yes, I am. I yeah. am. And, um, you know, when mum died, a a distant relative was allowed to get too close mm-hmm. to me. Um, and I was abused. And uh, and I that was one of the reasons why I attempted suicide on two occasions. So my life was hell. And you notice when you asked me about that period, I kind of just went from 11 to you 18. Yeah, yeah. But I didn't but, want to touch on it. I don't well, know no, no, I, no, I don't mind because yeah. I'm, I'm completely open. But I wanted to touch on it because that, this is what drives you yes. to get the answers. Yes, it that, is. Because maybe nobody thought you're corner back then. So you yeah. know what it's like to try and go down that route and get the answers. Yeah. Is yeah. that where you think you get your strength for, from? I think I have a deep sense of injustice which rages through mm. me, right? And I think that's for a number of reasons. One, yes, because I was abused, but not just that, because we were also seen as that sort of shameful family. So I carried shame anyway, you know, um, and we were impoverished. So I had all of these things. So it's like, I often say this is not a career, it's a calling. I think that I was crafted, right? Mm. I think we all are. But it's just whether you want to Believe be in tune or that or not. But I feel I was crafted. And I feel that everything that happened to me was completely relevant. Like there's nothing I'd change now. I wouldn't even change the abuse as much as it devastated me and that contributed to my breakdown. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't even change that now because it gives me such a layer of empathy towards people who have been down low without a voice. Mm-hmm. You can't buy that stuff. You can't, you know, you can't become that stuff. It, yeah. it, it, that's learned behavior. It's something that you know. Yeah. So, yeah, that informs me, definitely. Yeah. And that's why I want to touch on it, because that is where you get your strength, because you are mm-hmm. a fighter. And like you say there, it's like, sometimes we need to go through the bad shit in my life yeah. to become the warriors, the right warriors, whatever yeah. you want to call it, yeah. to try and do the right thing. Yeah. Because we know how fucked up it is to be in hell. And I'm myself and Cody's been in hell not just one time but many times. Right. And I've been blessed to eventually get myself out of it. Right. It still worries me that 
that you could potentially slip back or whatever with negative thoughts or bad days, whatever. But I believe I'm on a path as well. And I don't know what it is. I just love what I do, man. Yeah. And like yourself, yeah. you're constantly trying to get answers. Yeah. You're on your path, but the stuff you uncover is a lot deeper than what I do. Like I'll speak to someone who's done this. I'll try to uncover maybe every month or two. Right. You're probably every day. Oh, every day. 24-7. Do you know what I mean? 24-7. But... I do have a line now, mm -hmm. see, because where you are is you're going in deep on the on the survivor stories, mm -hmm. right? And the the detail there, I can't really do that too much these days, right? Because I did did that probably solidly for about five years, mm -hmm. where I immersed myself to understand what was going on on the level of survivors. So I don't know if you notice now, but generally I tend to focus much more, uh, certainly on the crime, but on the perpetrator rather than what was perpetrated on the because. Mm -hmm. The root of it? it? No, the root of it is really important mm -hmm. and all of that. But but some of the detail that we hear on YouTubes and everything, some of it is a bit like, it all feels a bit too much and mm -hmm. a bit too overwhelming. Do you know what I mean? I'm not talking about yours. I'm... There are, there are, I've seen some videos, and it's not usually professionals like you and Sean, but mm -hmm. there are some videos where people go into such extreme places that it almost kind of, I'm not articulating this very well, it's almost like it casts doubt on everything else yeah. because it just, it doesn't seem to have the ring of truth and everything. Yeah. So I'm very Seems wary. Seems a bit fake that people are manipulating there it There are people advantage. who definitely and do. And that's what Barbara warns me about that as well. And I always go back to Barbara because she's a true survivor. Right. Um, See, I've not met Barbara. Oh, she's a amazing right. woman you would love her and um she's been speaking out quite a lot like, i need to be careful as well because my p platform is growing and i don't want yes. to tread in toes i don't want yeah. to bring somebody in who's maybe telling lies yeah and the fact that then it scares everybody else a lot yeah. of people coming forward that's not my agenda now yeah. i've had over 100 guests i'm going to get people telling lies making mistakes and if that's the case i'll be the first one to hold my hands up and say sorry but I want people to tell their story from their side right but i need to be careful now as the platform is beginning yes. to grow that I don't put people off or I don't, yes. I'm not giving other people to spread their own agenda and bullshit yes. as well. So I need to be very careful and you know that yourself. It's very I mean. difficult because survivors by their nature can be problematic, right? So, you know, like one of the, I remember a producer once saying to me, I can't work with that man. He's an alcoholic. I was like, well, that, that. Mm -hmm often survivors have some addiction or another this comes with the territory and another producer once said to me you know i can't work i can't work with her because she can't articulate very very, very well and i said she can't articulate very 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 well because she's struggling to bring out what has actually taken place what has actually yeah. happened so you get different things sometimes really genuine legit people sound dodgy simply because of the experience they've been through mm -hmm. and they're not able necessarily to convey themselves yeah. but you do have to be careful and certainly you have to be very careful because you are building and you are becoming more and more powerful. So people will attach themselves to you, James. Mm -hmm. And in, and those people will also be people who may be a bit, you know, fucked up, frankly, mm -hmm. and want the limelight that you could potentially bring to yeah. them, right? But that doesn't mean I don't want to tar everybody. But yeah. you will start to get a sense who is legit and who isn't, mm. right? You definitely will, because I definitely have a sixth six sense yeah, now. I'd have that anyway, but again... Yeah, exactly. I need to be more... Do background checks a bit more. Yeah. To maybe make sure that, okay, they're above board and then... Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because I don't want to be used either. No. But it happens, man. Do you know what I mean? I'm not going to get it right all the time. It happens even mm -hmm. in mainstream media with all of the research, massive mm -hmm. research teams that they have to look into people's background before they step on a stage. Yeah. So it happens everywhere. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. yeah, we've got to talk, Sean, I know we'll talk about the McCann stuff, but the German suspect. Oh, for God's sake. So so obviously what we had was in recent times, uh, Scotland Yard announced a press conference in which mm -hmm. there was this stunning new suspect in the case of Madeline. And I'm not laughing in any disrespect to Madeline, just because the story is so ridiculous. You've got to bear in mind, time she's been missing, there's been over 8,000 sightings, right? Is that so correct, yeah. yeah. So this is not, this is not, stuff like this is not news, mm -hmm. right? There's always something. And there's an ongoing Operation Grange, which needs con continual funding, you know, twice mm -hmm. a year. So it, it's advantageous to them to, you know, do a little cheerlead and bring in, you know, the British public to carry on supporting this. But what they did was they had a press conference in which they said they had this, you know, new suspect German police were absolutely convinced that their man Christian Brook knows currently serving time in a German jail for drug, drugs charges and um, he's also uh, uh, there, there's some confusion here but basically he was 
he was, I, I believe, convicted of raping a pensioner before he left Portugal. He lived in Portugal for a period of time, but he's also been done on drugs charges. But anyway, basically, he's in German prison and he was originally appealing his sentence, but he's withdrawn his appeal now. But I've never seen a case where police and media are so determined to hang as many crimes on one person as they possibly can. Now, don't get me wrong. This is a repugnant individual. I am in no doubt that he is a rapist, that he does have a history of paedophilia. He's a career criminal. He's made life miserable for a lot and lot of people, right? But I don't see how he took Madeline from... Because this last week, what we had was German police who said they were convinced that he was responsible for the death of Madeline. They obviously want to still keep him inside. He's been before, though, questioned over this, Oh, yes, he? yes, yes. Mm -hmm. He's not new. He's not new. So, you know, he's... Been, mm -hmm. And th this is the thing, is that after you follow this case for a period of time, you start to realise there's a rotation yeah. of storylines that start to keep... Is that just the press trying to make more money? No, it was the police who engineered this and uh, pushed for this. And uh, But what we now have discovered that there may have been something lost in translation. So where the German police were saying before they had concrete evidence that he killed Madeleine, it now turns out apparently that concrete evidence in Germany actually means only a suspicion, a rumour. Well, we've suddenly gone all high alert. It's all over the, the headlines. It's, you know, all over the TV and everything. And I am very grateful to like LBC and various other places that I work for because they allow me to, within the bounds of keeping it legal, because you have to be careful, but they allow me to explore the story a bit more and push that official narrative a bit more. And LBC, to their credit, when this was all announced, they said to me, what do you think about it? I said, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. He's scapegoat Gonzalo Amaral, who was the original coordinator for the Portuguese police case. He'd said last week, last week, last year, April 2019, the, the, they're, they're so determined to close this case, they're going to get a German scapegoat. He said that over a year ago. And then what do we have, right? So just because this is a whirlpool, right? Mm -hmm. they, they named another German pedophile before and the press had named him, even though that wasn't who they were looking for. It's whirlpool, keep going yeah. around, keep, you know. Mm -hmm. But there are a number of reasons why they want this. Clearly the German police want to keep him inside, right? So they're, and also... Madeline is the world's most famous missing child. So any police force that solves what happened to Madeline, think about all the accolades and, and credits that would come to that police force, mm -hmm. right? That's, you know, an amazing yeah. thing to solve. Um, but the Portuguese police are not, they're supposed to be working together, three police forces. Uh, Portuguese police clearly not following what the German police are following. German police claim that Madeline's dead and that they had evidence, which turns out they don't mm. now, many weeks later, after all the headlines have been, you know, yeah. this is this is the man. Out of the millions of kids who go missing each year, why was Madeline so much in the press? Well... Their 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 public well their media man Clarence Mitchell who was actually he ran the media monitoring unit in Parliament before becoming Kate mm. and Jerry McCann's so again another parliamentary connection here and he's a very influential man Clarence Mitchell but he described all the publicity as a perfect storm so what you had were nice middle class doctor parents mm. nice little blonde good looking girl holiday resorts, you know what I mean? Sort of sun, sea, sangria mm -hmm. kind of thing. Lovely child, perfect storm all coming together. But there were still other things. There were still other things going yeah. on in the background. Why the could you not pressure. get done with neglect then? Could you not get done in Portugal for neglect? You can, but Portugal work on a slightly different basis to the UK and Portuguese, they charge on the higher, the higher charge. So there was a reluctance. Well, there was a number of, one, the, um, not the police chief, but um, I think like the prosecutor came out afterwards and said that they felt so sorry for the McCanns that th they initially didn't want to prosecute them for that anyway, for neglect. And actually, as time went on, because there was a belief that what somebody in that party knew what had happened to Madeline, I think there was a feeling that they didn't want to prosecute for something as small as neglect. Mm -hmm. I say that like that when they actually could be prosecuting for. for yeah. Yeah. The Reigns List. Yeah. What's that you've spoke about a few times? I have. That was compiled by Dr. Joan Coleman. Dr. Joan Coleman became quite famous in the 80s. Um, I think she was a, a psychotherapist, but she may have been a psychiatrist. Forgive me, I often get the psychs wrong. Mm. Um, and Joan, who I met before she died, um, I went to her house. She died, was it last summer or summer before? But anyway, in recent times. But Joan was the, um, had become the 
professional who children who were said to have been involved in some sort of ritualistic behavior were being sent to her she became you know quite well known as this and actually in the 80s they demonized her and said called it satanic panic and everything and they tried to demonize her and but in the 90s it all turned around and it showed that actually her work had some real validity to it but joan had compiled this list which is available online and it features many famous men and women and Joan um, compiled that list on the basis that independent witnesses from her children who were coming forward supplied these names and she would put them on I think at least two had to name these people individually before they made, made the reigns list but a lot but oftentimes you'd get as many as five independent children who didn't know each other name these people well of course that's some evidence there mm. and the same applied with edward heath edward heath most famously was named to joan um on a number of occasions and the thing that joan had which i'd already become aware of but i asked her about it when i met her um because i'd heard this what appeared to be a scandalous rumor about edward heath and that was when he was said to abuse children obviously former british prime minister when he was said to have abused children he was said to have used something like a mechanical prosthetic hand because he didn't want to touch them himself. So he touched them with this kind of prosthetic hand. And I asked her about that. She said, yeah, that was that had been told mm -hmm. to her independently by these children. So she compiled the reigns list. Joan is now dead. Um, but I met her and I, I trusted. I, I can't tell you about the veracity of the reigns list, right? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of... A lot of very famous people yeah. from, you know, the world of acting, celebrity, media. These are very, very, very well-known people. And far be it for me. I don't want to, I don't want to create more victims than we need to, right? Yeah. And inaccurately naming people as doing something creates a victim of somebody who may have nothing to do with it. So I'm always reluctant about that. But all I can tell you is Joan compiled it on the basis of independent reports of children who said that these people had been involved in their abuse. Mm -hmm. And it's available online, R-A-I-N-S. Yeah, and it's scary to think. So your whole outcome of all, all these paedophile rings, Epstein from Prince Andrew yeah. to Glenn Maxwell... Do you just think it's a worldwide thing? I do. I, children are a currency. Yeah. The sexual abuse of children is a currency. Mm -hmm. We know that the secret services have for decades used children. Um, you know, they secret services covered up for Cyril Smith, covered up the abuse of Cyril Smith that was going on. We know that the secret services have, I mean, I've talked with, you know, agents who have told me this. It's a, it's an agent in um, paedophiles in part several actually um, including ex-cops and they were quite categoric that one of the um, things that uh, secret services do is they have blackmail pictures of um, you know international um, politicians you know with children and they have these images and they blackmail them because that's how they can you know get support for various laws mm. whether that's war or other laws and and children are the currency yeah. and i'm in no doubt that that happens mm -hmm. and has been happening for a very long time yeah so going forward for the future what's your plans then what are you going to keep fighting well to stay alive yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's the major one isn't it? It's the major one so what's your plans well um oh gosh do you know the thing the thing is james is i'm not a big planner Day by day. I, I, look, I, and maybe again, that's my background. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I'm, I live in the moment. I really mm -hmm. live in the moment. Some people call me a commitment phobe. In fact, I call myself a commitment phobe. Mm -hmm. But because I do have difficulty like planning huge times in advance because I'm like, I'm here now. Me and you are here, you know, we're all here together mm -hmm. and we're creating this and this becomes an entity in its own right. And so I don't, I try generally, other than obviously I have to have dates for meetings, pending and stuff, but I try not to think too far advanced because mm -hmm. I like to be present. Power of now. It's really important to me. Yeah, and I do believe in that, you know, because mm -hmm. I know how important that is. I mean, people, we, they will be able to pick this up just from, but there is an incredible atmosphere between you and I about mm. because it's real and it's like real yeah. real stuff that we're mm. you know talking Having about and penetrating about it, yeah. here yeah real stuff and you can feel it mm. that's spiritual yeah that's spiritual mm. and so yeah, yeah that's one of the things I like about you because you're not just talking about the people who's dead now Ted Heath Jimmy Savile they all get mentioned yeah probably nearly yeah every interview that people kind of discuss sure. these kind of topics but you talk about the people who are still alive to this day oh absolutely and you we must I mean? I mean there's what there's one politician who and of course I'm not I'm not 
suggesting, well, I'm, I'm not claiming at this moment that this man is a paedophile, but this is a man who has a history of being in places where he is covered, and that is Keith Faz. And Keith Faz is an extremely influential Labour MP who has been on various standards committees. And Keith Faz was involved with um, Lord Janner, who was who is now dead, and who was accused of abuse of children in Leicester care homes. And when, and they have this thing called parliamentary privilege, which I talk about in paedophiles in parliament so people feel free to find the film and you'll see what i mean yeah we'll put the link in the yeah. description so parliamentary privilege is basically where politicians can stand up in parliament say whatever it is they want to and n questions cannot be asked and then it goes down in hansard and that becomes mm -hmm. the official record well lord janna stood up in parliament said these rumors of me being involved in the abuse of children they're awful they're heinous all went down in hansard of course and then keith faz stood up and supported him because keith faz was very good friends with janna's son when they, when they all came came from Leicester. So this is a continuation of politicians. Keith Faz, we know, mm -hmm. was exposed on the front pages of having a taste for young Eastern European men. But what we've yet to see, Keith Faz was also, somebody had contacted me because they'd put, they'd done a, a petition about Keith Faz. This person lived in Leicester. They did a petition to local Leicester councillors saying there is enough information on Keith Faz, allegations of uh, potential child abuse that he should be investigated. Keith Faz was also one of the people that when the Edward Heath um, investigation started, Keith Faz took it upon himself to go after the chief inspector of Wiltshire Police who was carrying out the investigation. Yeah, yeah. why? What, what's, what business is that, is that of yours, mate? Edward Heath wasn't even in your, in your political party. He was a Tory. What, what's this business of yours? So Keith Faz, we know rather a lot about him, certainly in terms of his sexual taste. But there was also a Sun headline, right? And, and it, this is an open secret. And it, the Sun headline was about a politician who had a taste for young boys that they called ragamuffins and everything. And the open secret was that Sun headline was about Keith Fass, right? So the point is, this is somebody who's still running around in Parliament, extremely influential and completely untouched by all of this. And so I think it's absolutely, I'm not claiming he's a paedophile. I'm saying that there are sufficient rumours that they should be investigated. There are sufficient rumours. This is somebody who sits on standard mm -hmm. committees telling the rest of us how we should be conducting our lives, yeah. right? So no, I'm not in, I'm not, yeah, I'm all for exposing anybody who is involved in child abuse, right? Dead or alive. But everybody goes after the dead ones because they obviously they can't There's speak no back. There's no comeback, can't get There's sued. no comeback, yeah, yeah, yeah. no comeback at all. Whereas me, I am prepared to stand mm. in a court of law with any of them, any of them, right? Whether that is, um, oh, who was the, obviously there was the, sorry, sorry, James, you know, the thing is I could do so many cases that sometimes mm -hmm. the information just, mm -hmm. uh, Harvey Proctor, Tory politician, he was loads of headlines in the 80s about how he was into spanking young boys and everything. And they kind of, kind of you know, portrayed him as a, a pervert and everything. Well, he was the one who was accused by um, Nick, who has now been, who is now inside after he, this guy, Nick, um, had come out and said that he'd, I think he'd watched Harvey Proctor kill a boy and did you know, all manner of stuff like this. Well, um, so Nick is now inside for, they said he was lying and everything. And that kind of killed off all the allegations about paedophiles in parliament. Again, that's in my documentary. Um, but Harvey Pro Proctor is a perfect example because when you start to look through the records and look at, so Harvey Proctor called a, a press conference, right? So he was accused of stuff, but he called it a press conference, which is quite an extreme response in a very, very flash hotel. Um, and uh, and he had his kind of like day in the press conference and uh, and any allegations with him were dismissed. But when you start to look at what was and wasn't allowed in court, you have to start to worry because, you know, when they'd done a search of Harvey Proctor's home, for example, they had found um, school uniform with blood on it, right? That never made it to court, right? So stuff like that, yeah. right? So somebody's allowed to stand up and say, I have been accused of being a paedophile and I will not have it. And then everybody believes him and gives him a book deal and everything else like that. But then there's this other stuff that you find in police files. So yeah. to me, I can't let up. Yeah, I, I yeah, can't let up. Yeah, yeah. What do you think happened to Jill Dando? Because what information I get that she was going to expose paedophile rings, high people and the music industry, film, yeah. people were still in the TV game to this day. 
that she was that was a hit out now because she was going to expose a lot of big names. That of course is the story. That is the story. Whether it's true or not, what I will say to you is we are currently investigating actually we've been given new information mm-hmm. on Jill Dando, which I can't talk about because yeah. we really need to get this legal in mm-hmm. a very serious way. But if what I've been told is true and when we release it, mm-hmm. it's it's gonna change the landscape. Mm-hmm. The official story is absurd. What did they say? She pissed off some Serbian or something who'd come to her doorstep. Mm -hmm. I mean, none of that makes any sense. If you look at the people who were around when she was found, that was very curious, right? For example, her friend, um, who is a TV producer who lives two streets away, happened to be in her street that day and and saw... And I'm not making any allegations about her friend. I'm just saying, because no, I don't think it was even necessarily portrayed about her friend being involved in TV. Mm -hmm. And it was all... And like... But there was a, there's a lot of strange. There was a lot of strange. Clarence Mitchell, who became the McCann spokesman, was one of the first journalists on the scene reporting from Jill Dando's uh, death. Right. Mm. So it's often just not the same people all again. Yeah. You know? Do you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And these stuff is curious to yeah. me when it's always the same people yeah, yeah, swimming yeah, yeah. in the same bowl. Mm-hmm. What about Michael Barrymore stuff? Because I speak to Sue yeah. and Terry. I'm, I, I know Terry's not well now. He's right. back in the home. I, I speak to Sue quite a lot. <laughs> who lost her son at Michael Barrymore's pool. What do you think the situation with that is? Sue, who was married to... Yeah, Terry. Stuart. No, t- so... T- Terry. Yeah, so, so Terry Terry's Terry's the dad. father yeah. and it's Stuart Lubbock. Stuart's in the pool. That is a scandal. You know that Essex police have reopened that. Obviously, they've got a new investigation yeah. of that now with a reward. They're clear, and I believe them. Somebody there knows what happened to Stuart, right? Mm-hmm. I think what happened... I mean, that Channel 4 programme, I think, was quite compelling. They came back with a lot of answers to the outstanding questions that had taken place and that was um because they they've been this suge- i mean clearly what had happened to Stuart was uh, he'd been anally raped with something i mean something awful had happened to that poor lad you know um and uh, and we know that Barrymore left the scene we know that there was some clearing up of the scene um there were certain things that were left behind that forensics later felt that may have been instrumental in the abuse and the attack on Stuart and that I think there was a, like a pl- plunger, poor plunger. Mm-hmm. yeah and and they did I'm um, obviously Barrymore's people and everything they were like fighting this off and they, they said things like he he that Stuart had experienced his injuries once he got to the mortuary and all stuff like that. Well, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a mortician, but to my knowledge, the body cannot become injured once it's dead. Do you know what I'm saying? Because yeah. it's no longer alive mm-hmm. to respond to that injury. You can't, body can't bruise after death. Do you know? Mm-hmm. I don't think so. Unless yeah. somebody's going to watch this and go, no, actually, I can give you this case that happened in Ontario in 1640. Do you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Yeah. So, but to my knowledge, how Stuart was in the mortuary is how he arrived, right? That occurred before he died. Um, and uh, I don't think Michael Barrymore has ever really dealt with that head on. I know he says mm-hmm. he has. And ITV have constantly tried to rehabilitate him to into the yeah. public again. I think his head's fucked on it. I think he knows information that he may be too scared to. Do I think it was him that killed him? Or, I don't think so. I think he knows what happened. Though. Right. I think, I think he knows. Stuart was held down. Yeah. And I think he was yeah. raped. Yeah. And he's died by that. Yeah, because he might not have just been raped by somebody's penis. Yeah. Eh? And that's yeah, the yeah. thing. Internal bleeding or something. Yeah. It's just. How, it, what, was it, what was the cause of death? I, I don't, don't know. I think it was. It was it's to do. Was something like it that. It was huh? internal. Yeah. I don't remember exactly. Because um, Sue's amazing, man. Sue's Terry and they've been fighting. All this My time heart breaks to, for yeah, them. to get their answers. It's I wrong. believe they will. I believe the truth will come out. It's twenty years yeah. in February. No, March. Ne- yeah, next year. March yeah. twenty years. So isn't it time now? Yeah. You know, and they've been allowed to maintain this silence. That little group, mm-hmm. right? I just, I just, all this stuff kind of just boggles my mind how mm-hmm. law can allow you know you were there this man died in a very brutal way yeah. right how can law just allow these people just to just get on with their lives you know what i'm saying yeah, yeah it's crazy but hopefully they get answers because they are good yeah. people just before we finish up would yeah. you like to finish up on anything yourself i think so it's been lovely having you yeah, though probably, i really yeah, enjoyed this conversation my absolute ones. pleasure yeah, good vibes and for anybody that's maybe a survivor or going through the struggle it's maybe been abused and they're looking to turn to someone what advice would you give for them oh it's very very difficult um i mean there are always survivor groups online and it's but it's it's very difficult i'm again if you'd have asked me this a few years ago i would have wriggled off a list of 
survivors yeah. groups to send people to but bit by bit as you start to explore them and you start to explore where people are coming from it's very it's harder to start to, trust. Con- to recommend mm-hmm. um so i i i i I actually don't know how to answer that. I mean, put it this way. If there's somebody watching this and they are so desperate to relieve something, then please feel free to email me and I will endeavor to help Mm. to put you in touch with somebody who could help you. Because I do do that. I do put Mm -hmm. survivors in touch with um, good professionals that I can vouch for, you know, good psychiatrists, good psychologists, or just a decent counselor, you know. But a lot of the groups now are problematic. You just don't know where they're coming from. Mm Because you don't know whether they've actually... Some of them have been set up to infiltrate the movement and, mm. you know, and create more problems or whether, whether they are yeah. genuine helpers. Yeah. One awful position that we're in where people who are claiming to be helpers mm. are now subject to all this suspicion. But yeah. that's what the world has done to mm-hmm. us. Sonia. Pleasure. It's been an absolute it's been, pleasure. It has been an absolute um, pleasure. Thank listen, you so thanks much. Thanks for coming Thank on you. and, and telling Thank your you. story and getting your knowledge out there. Thank you. It's very much appreciated. I wish you all the best for the future. Likewise. Stay strong and Thank keep you. fighting. Thank Bye. you.